And we are live. So if everybody could just talk and we make sure that everybody's sounding good on this end. All right, Jack, one, two. That's real nice. And uh, I think. Yeah, Black yeah, I'm here. Awesome. Lady Bro Flacco. All right, so dope. Uh, we can uh, we can get into it. So first of all, Mr. J Smooth, I appreciate you coming through and taking your time to uh, share anything with us. Uh, I say anything in that vague sense because I've been binge watching J Smooth videos all week, and uh, I, okay, it went from like the research element of it to you could watch a video at any point in your career blot out the year and it's like this consistent spectrum of like shit i wish i'd heard about 10 years ago and i think that is by far one of the most interesting minds you're one of the most interesting minds that was terrible framing that we've encountered so <laughs> with that uh my name is holden stefan roy and this is bridge the gap joining uh with the end of the week edition with mr flacco bayo as the the co-host liddy bro Fac flacco sorry i said it wrong we uh we working on the proper brandings and things um but we appreciate you having uh, having you here so bridge the gap is an idea where uh we take people who are like you mr j smooth very very smart interesting folk who have done things with life you know just things along life and then we go through your story and we extract knowledge nuggets so that we can all be better individuals after by uh, the experiences you have accumulated and thus bridge gaps along the way. Because uh, in my case, I'm born in Montreal, Quebec, right? All of my experiences and stuff have this little shade of like the existence of my thing. So I come and talk to people all over and I realize that, yo, so much of the world, in my opinion, is, is based on this ignorance of understanding others. And in you in particular, you seem to be a guy that is an expert on this whole topic in general, which is truly fascinating because, like, your takes are so interesting and they age perfectly. Like, whose hot takes age so perfectly? <laughs> well, that's that's good to hear because I'm never sure. You know, I hate to go back and watch my old stuff just because I don't want to see myself. So that's good to hear other people feel that way. Nah, for I, I was, like, enamored with it. And the sound of your voice, the profet all of it. Um, Unquestionably. It unquestionably bro like i still like none of the all the things that i link people to that you've done that's like with wild pride like look at look at this is a man that i call friend yeah. <laughs> He's incredibly intelligent <laughs> Nah, it's really cool though that you're here with us, but you are still involved in music in some way. So my token first question before we go through your life will still apply. You've done radio as I understand it or, or doing that was, it's a little hard to piece together what you're currently doing versus what you've done in the past. So, uh, radios, podcasts, the YouTube videos, the, the everything that's, that's happening with the ill doctrines and things. So like, you've got all sorts of stuff attached to you and it's all related to hip hop in some way. So let's do this first question. It's a bit of a story, but when it lands, you'll be like, all right, all right. And you'll be able to answer it. And it all starts with my girlfriend and she's washing the dishes and she's listening to that, um, black eyed piece on that. I got a feeling and whatever she's dancing and stuff and i'm like watching her and i'm thinking back to like 10 years ago times when i was young and drunk in clubs at two in the morning and we're in a circle jumping up and down dancing to that very same song and i'm like yo that's kind of nifty if you think about it that the club music of the past has not become the chores music of today at least or whatever exercise music i've been corrected there's there's more than one place it fits into in my world it was chores music and um I started thinking about vibes because that means all the modern club music, all that stuff. It's chores music in the future. And I thought that was a funny thought for a quick minute, but it actually uh, made me really think about vibes. And it really brought me back when I, when I was really, really young. Because like a lot of times when we think about music, people start in the teenage years and stuff because that's often when we attach our identities to music. But that's not really the start of our musical journeys by any means. In fact, music's almost always been around us in some way or another. So it brought me back to being like super young and my dad had these tapes and he would play his Led Zeppelins and that was his jams. And I remember like Krista Berg was a car thing. Like we never listened to Krista Berg in the apartment for some reason. And my mom had those really bad disco knockoff tapes and she would play those. And it was all the radio going on in the 90s and stuff. So that was all like this atmosphere that guided and started my musical journey. And, and I asked 
as I ask people this question, I find everybody's got a mad different answer. Like people's answers are not consistent on this, but it often really just ties right into whatever they do with their life. So I thought it would be super interesting if we could talk about like a super, super young Jay Smooth, like a, you know, five, whatever, your earliest memories. And what do the sounds of that was like before you had any control of the music yourself? Yeah, that's a real good question. Let me say, first of all, thanks so much for having me here. Shout out to y'all. Shout out to the whole end of the week crew love that whole community so much rest in peace vice versus uh i was blessed to have eo dub collaborate with me on my radio show many times so i'm always glad to reconnect and uh contribute from any sort of even one degree two degrees away but yeah uh i definitely grew up you know i grew up in a real artistic musical family my father was a poet who uh worked with guile and kane who's one of the original last poets wow. um if you know there's wow. the the most famous incarnation of the last poets that came a little later, but the original last poets, um, David Nelson, Guile and Kane, and Felipe Luciano, who did the Right On album, that's like the original, the originators of the last poets. My father worked with Guile and Kane from that crew, so I grew up in a you know a black arts poetry household on my dad's side, and my mom was involved in jazz music, and of course you know my dad was a music head too, um, so yeah, I grew up around like. Yeah, that sort of last poets, Amiri Baraka flavor on the poetic side. And then musically, like, I feel like I've been listening to Stevie Wonder since In the Womb, you know, John Coltrane, um, all of that sort of thing. I remember a vivid childhood memory. You know, there's a lot of vinyl memories okay. um, from my early childhood. And, you know, one one memory that's imprinted on me is this one Earth, Wind and Fire album. I can't remember which album it is, but. You know, it's the fold out cover and on the inside they're performing in these 70s spandex costumes and there's all this, the smoke machines are setting off the smoke while they perform. And I know nothing about smoke machines or what to make of these costumes. And it was, I felt like I was looking at some kind of black magic ritual or something. <laughs> it like, <laughs> like intrigued and freaked me out looking at this, these pictures of Earth, Wind and Fire doing their thing. So I was... My imagination was definitely captured by a lot of uh, that 60s, 70s black music, for sure. That's you know, really... what's dope is that there's a link now that you said the last poets because Albie was on the show. Albie back was uh, on yeah. the show and he talked about his link um, with his, uh, I think it's his uncle, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I don't remember the so link, dope. but definitely it's come up. And I just find the last poet super cool in general. The, they've definitely been sampled on a few tracks I've come across on my like review quest. And uh, I just looked them up and realized how fucking innovative they are to a lot of different things as far as like the, yeah. the history is concerned. And anytime their name comes up, it's like, that's cool. That's like, a, that's a flex, in my opinion. Kanye sampled them a couple times. Uh, actually, today talking about earlier, talking about that good kid Twisted Fantasy mixtape that came out, they used the Last Poets um, audio that Kanye used on um, something else, and it was amazing. Yeah, they definitely got a lot of run, and I should put Gil Scott Heron's name in the mix as well. Mm. Facts. Now, the musician and spoken word god, you know, that's all like the primordial soup the hip hop thing comes out of for sure. So, like, mm -hmm. literally, like, you're young in this environment that is connected to the, these people, which is just, it's just really cool. Like, I don't have a better word. It's cool. Uh, so, I'm so <laughs> grateful that you shared that with yeah, us. Yeah, it was a blessing. Definitely a bless. You know, I think we're all blessed to have our formative years happen when there's some kind of dope artistic movement we could connect to. But I definitely feel blessed as a hip hopper to have. You know, been born in the early 70s, come of age in the 80s, in New York, in Harlem. That was the um, next question. I call it a privilege. Yeah, I call it a privilege just, for yeah, us to come, be able to come to, from... Just take in that energy of this culture. That <laughs> energy of New York City back then was yeah. so... Like, I've never encountered that type of energy anywhere I've been to. And I ha it's not like I've been all across everywhere in the world, but I have been to a lot of, a lot of places. And I've been to just about every major city in America, um, with the exception of Anchorage and Alaska. I've never been to Alaska, but like, I've Anchorage. been to so every I met, state. I met Rock Steady crew representatives in Anchorage. That's crazy. Everything that's crazy. connected. That's crazy. So that's cool. So you're like really young. And as I understand it, as I've talked to some people, this means that you can't go outside without hip hop and some manifestation being around you. 
uh, because most of us don't come from that beautiful environment and it does not something that a lot of us really understand uh, that could you like expand on what it's like like just just like whatever because anything you share adds to the global context of what it's like to grow up in that culture versus maybe the YouTube generation later on yeah I mean it's something I don't think you could really describe if you're not there what it's like to be grounded in and connected to this culture while it's still developing and becoming so vibrant and creative, but while it's like not mainstream at all. Like it's something that's our thing in our communities that we are loving and are so proud of, but 99% of the population has no, it's like, it's like if, uh, I'm trying to think of a comparison. Um, like what's, <laughs> What's something that people think is mad childish right now? If you like, if you're like super, super, it's hard to even compare because nerd culture gets the type of respect it doesn't get now. But let's wrestling, say, maybe. Like, no, I rest, mean, maybe wrestling's on the up and up now, though, in a respect. Right. Part. It's hard. Yeah, yeah, I feel like there's there's so many ways that those kind of subcultures get some kind of. Yeah, they get. They get I, like, can't, I can't think, but let's imagine. You all remember Pogs? Yeah. Yeah. Twenty they, years ago, like think twenty years ago. If somebody found out you were a grown man that was into pogs, that's how that's how people looked at you. If you said you took hip hop seriously, so we just got then. a comment: yeah. Logan Paul. Like, imagine Logan right. Paul goes <laughs> fucking mainstream, but I think it fits in right. really well. So, if all of a sudden right. Logan Paul's trollish behavior is the super like big norm, right? It, like in the eighties, if I would have told someone, "Yo, people are gonna have college courses one day where they study what we're doing," people would have looked at you like, "Yeah, okay, kid." <laughs> you know. So, um, so I kind of, I, I watched, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, right? Or how much you might like rock with it or not rock with it, right? But like, I watched Blackish and then I watched all their spinoff shows. Yeah. So like Mixedish and uh, Grownish. And on Mixedish, they had like a episode, and their show is like based back in the days when um, Tracy Ellis, uh, Tracy. Ellis Tracy Ross. Ross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ross. Yeah. Tracy Ellis Ross's uh, character is growing up. And like she's married to a white dude, and like she's uh, teaching him how to play spades. Mm -hmm. And her sister keeps on telling him, like, telling her, like, he's going to ruin this. He's going to ruin this for you. And she's like, no, like, he's wild, like, understanding and accepting, and just, you know, he gets it. Like, he's not, you know, uh, your average uh, white guy, right? And so, she keeps on going and he gets really good, right? Like he listens and like she's like training him the whole episode, you know, like all the like mannerisms for playing spades and like they go to play spades and like she realizes like <clears throat> that he did ruin it. Like just by his mere presence being there was kind of like ruining it because it's like everybody's energy shifted because he was in the room. Mm -hmm. And he's white, you know? And so we always change our attitude when people from not our culture enter the room to accommodate them mm -hmm. into our spaces, right? And then that changes and shifts the mood. So it's just like, it's it's like that. It's where it's just like, it's really hard to explain uh, uh, what that was. Like, it was just this thing that was ours and nobody nobody thought we were sane. We were all crazy. Like, oh, this fat, this rapidity rap shit. Like, you know, like, this is not, this is not the, uh, the thing to, like, hang your hat on is what they all thought. And it was like, no, we are going to firmly plant our hats here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it was like a mat, and that, when it's yours and you have so much pride in it, and for the most part, the world doesn't respect it. Like, there's a love and, like, it's just, like, protectiveness kind of love. Like, this is my shit. And I'm going to represent this. I want to scream to the world, how do you not recognize how dope this is, what we're doing? But, you know, in retrospect, we can really see having it to ourselves had a whole lot of advantages. Like, that's, it's a special time that you can't recreate. And, there's, you know, there's always a gift and a curse. Like, hip-hop in its original forms, there wasn't supposed to be any hip-hop records. You know what I'm saying? Like, old school, old school heads would be like, why are they pressing this up on wax? That's not even what hip-hop culture is supposed to be. But the compromise is it gets to go around the world and affect people in different ways. So, there, you know, there's always good and bad that comes from expanding. That's a really interesting point that nobody's yeah. talked about. And I think it's interesting in my life because there's the meta conversation of real hip hop. 
that seems right. to be floating around right now. But you're basically going, if you go way, way, way back, people is even saying at a point, real hip hop should never even be recorded. That's yeah, actually a that's fascinating how, statement. Can you expand a bit on that? That's how that's how a lot of heads from the seventies looked at it. Like Grandmaster Flash has talked about people stepped to him about you should make a record and he turned it down every time because he's like, What do you mean make a record? Like hip hop exists. Hip hop manifests in the community form of a party that goes for four hours, six hours. Like for us to have a record where I'm doing I don't know what you want me to do for not five minutes, 10 minutes, that doesn't even make sense. And you know, when, uh, when Sugar Hill Gang first blew up, that record was what, like nine minutes, 13 minutes long. We would sit here and say, that's mad long for one song. Back then it was like, that's way too short. <laughs> How are you gonna do hip hop for only 13 minutes? And that like, I, to people, you'll, you could talk to lots of 70s heads that'll say that was the beginning of the watering down of hip hop in its purest form, but Along with that curse comes the gift of it gets to spread around the world. There's all these amazing hip hop communities, you know, voices like Public Enemy get to politicize people around the world like that. We don't get all of that if we don't have that that friction between art and commerce of Sylvia Robinson from Sugar Hill Records, who is stepping in this to make money. She says, hey, we could make a record and sell a million copies like that, that that compromise and friction between art and, you know, American commerce that's there's things that are lost and things that are gained and I think you know you got to be ready to just ride that wave and figure out where the meaning and the community and the essence of your art can continue in that mix yo you've already said a lot of really smart stuff like really <laughs> profound like you know this is a blessing for us to have you here like we're gonna learn we're all gonna be better people after this conversation just because of your insight my guy um I mean that sincerely, dude. Like, I'm really thinking about what you're saying because I'm trying to learn this stuff. And I had a conversation recently with a lady who told me about one time. Uh, well, she's from here. She's an MC, And she went to New York when she was 10. She did that crap where they, um, not crap, but the thing where you, like, download the music videos onto the VHSs, and, which was weird because somebody else had told me that that's what they did, right? So she got that for a minute and brought it back home. And the one thing she conveyed to me is that New York and Montreal were not the same. Like, when you turned on your television you saw hip hop and I, that really resonated with me because I did not see hip hop when I turned right. on my, the first time I really encountered this shit was at a fair in the parking lot in a mall and they're playing my name is by Eminem. That is the first time I can consciously remember hearing a rap song of any kind and going, nah, this is dope. And it's not that it didn't exist, but it didn't really exist outside of like late night radio where I'm from. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I can see that. You know, I've spent a lot of time in Montreal, by the way. I love it up there. Um, and the first time I uh, went to see a DJ spinning up there, um, it was ill for me because I had never been somewhere that there's a DJ DJing and ev and everyone else there is like standing watching the DJ. Because in New York, like, like I was saying about hip hop being this community thing that you all come together and do, like if the DJ is rocking, you interact with that by dancing, by reacting to the music. Like it's, ev everyone in the room is, is, is a participant, is a practitioner. So I remember, and I think that's, that's become a common thing in many places now. I, I guess the role of the DJ has also changed to like, you know, you're on stage pumping your fist <laughs> and 50,000 people are standing and watching. So maybe, maybe I caught an early part of the arc that DJ was taking. But, but back at that time, I was like, wow, I, this is a whole different way of relating to the culture than what I grew up with. You know what's crazy is because of um, COVID, Twitch has now become the home of DJs and it's like yeah. a return to form to almost what you're describing. Yeah, yeah, Just, yeah. That's why I love like DJs. Like who was I trying to, I was watching Scratch Bastard early on in the pandemic doing a, a whole set and, you know, he had it set up as like a Zoom meeting where different people's cams would come on while he was DJing you would see how each person is partying and grooving so yeah I definitely see what you're saying holy shit that's actually a really good idea just on a tech front that was I'm gonna that's like I just had yeah, a mental yeah. note moment there <laughs> Yo, thank you. anyway um yeah uh one of my guys in the chat Ismail is like you're a living hip-hop encyclopedia I like that <laughs> nah for real that's cool man uh and I say that sincerely because it's like yeah, there's no, a lot of stuff I don't yeah. understand like I come into hip hop I start rapping myself in 2012 jump on a stage I'm 25 and I'm like Hobson's the best fuck Lil Wayne type guy so you, <laughs> you know just to paint a picture I've come a long yeah. way I've come a mm -hmm. long way
but it's it's been uh, difficult to Google this stuff. Uh, yeah, and I'm I'm always glad when people don't try to learn just from Googling because there's a lot of not to get on hating anyone. You know, I I appreciate anyone. No, this is not directed to you, but I'm like watching. There's channels on YouTube where it's like some kid who's way too young to have grown up in it, and they will be getting hundreds of thousands of views, and there's other kids in the comments like, yeah, you're such a scholar. And for me, who grew up with it, I could see this person Googled and wikipedia and is getting a whole bunch of little things wrong that you're going to get wrong if you weren't there. And then yeah. enough of that happens, and that just becomes the conventional wisdom. So uh, as yeah. long as people are, you know, uh, cultivating that hip hop community tradition and like connecting with people who are there and learning that way. I think that's always a dope thing. It's funny you say that too, because I did reviews for about four years pretty religiously, like a lot of hip hop reviews and stuff. So I got scolded by the comments into learning. Um, yeah. and, and let me say like, you don't have to have been an OG to be thoughtful about music and write about it. Just be real with yourself about your relationship to it. Like if you're an outsider, if you're a newcomer, just be transparent about yeah. that perspective He's when you right write though. about it. When you say, no, yeah. because I do video versions and I can tell you at first I was arrogant and yo, I was not accepted right. quite by all the audience. In fact, right. I'm pretty sure they were lampooning me at first and that's what got, and it got me more views to be honest. But then I went down the route of education and my views went down. But why I thought it was super interesting is because lately I realized there's this meta game happening in like this, this review sphere where the only way to like get views now is to basically promote certain kinds of hip hop of certain types of things. And they all kind of have certain things in common with Eminem. Um, and I don't just mean skin color. It's, it's, it's more of a sonic thing. It's more mm. of a fast and these subjects are appropriate, right? Cause it's not like Dax would be in that crew of people, right? Just as an example of somebody who's not, who fits it perfectly. And this is somehow like superior. And I'm watching these, these guys who basically make this kind of hip hop go, I'm a rapper, drop a little bar or two, clip from their song ad, and then go on to scholarize it in the way that you're describing um, as it goes on. But the thing is, is they do have this reach and my videos get like 200 views, right? And I put a lot of effort in. So it actually right. is having this impact on a generation of people and it's kind of creating the ecosystem that allows a Tom McDonald to take the place he's taking. And I believe that the reviewers are actually like one of the biggest things. It's not that different than the role hip hop media played like 20 years ago, right? It's just that now it's a bunch of people like me that don't care as much as me about the culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah, I feel like that's a shift that really started happening at some point in the 90s. I mean, it's partly because I think our first generation of hip hop writers and journalists didn't keep our shit together well enough because, you know, I'm old enough to remember when the Source magazine was actually the Bible. Like I started picking it up in like 1990. There's like a five year stretch where that was really the gold standard for taking hip hop seriously, writing about it from an insider to the culture's perspective. But we, you know, it's like how Black Panthers let COINTELPRO fuck shit up. Like we, internal flaws mm -hmm. let Benzino come in there and fuck up the whole operation. And the foundation that we could have kept eventually, it got taken over more and more by this next generation of white hipsters who became the gatekeepers. And maybe that was inevitable over time, but I feel like uh, it's never quite been the same uh, since that shift happened. And like I, when that first like kind of pitchfork generation of critic became the main hip hop critics. Yeah, I never understood exactly how that happened. I mean, I, now I do, but at the time, I, I, I don't, I've never read a pitchfork review. I'll be completely real with you. <laughs> or I've tried a couple. There's, of there's, let me say, there's some, there's some good people that write for pitchfork because it's just the nature of media. There's only so many outlets that are profitable. So if you're a, a writer trying to earn a living, you're going to wind up in one of those outlets sometimes. So I'm not knocking everything at pitchfork there's definitely good people there but yeah. overall their history is shaky what they represent um, right it's more right. like i never like print media reviews that much uh to be honest i feel i find they're vapid and in video reviews at least you can go into more depth or get a more of like a subjective you get a lot more of the subjectivity in video and, and so, so you prefer watching video reviews interesting 
because honestly, um, I make reviews before. I, so I didn't actually look into reviews until I started doing reviews. And I realized that I don't think there's many reviewers that go half as hard as I do on it. And none of the print review dudes guide They're all one listen, copy paste lyric dudes. So you can yeah. feel that in like, even Pitchfork. I'm sorry, your guys are dropping your fucking uh, reviews at two in the morning. Okay, like, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I can't go that fast. And I've stolen the album like you did. We got it on the European leagues too. Try, I know all the moves, but like, there's no way that you can listen to an Eminem album one time and critically review it. I learned that recently. I got smashed really fucking hard on YouTube. But usually I did seven listens and I saw things they never did. So it's like, okay, these guys don't try as hard. So it's actually just boring. I don't know if it was like that in the 90s, but I feel like it was like that in 2011 for my like desires out of what I would want in a review. Yeah, it was definitely. I mean, I was writing for The Source in 1991. And it no was shit. like it was it was like that back then. Cause just because not not because you as a reviewer didn't want to take it seriously, but just the way the system works is the magazine comes out once a month and you're writing on the deadline. You get this cassette tape um, and they tell you, OK, give get this review in by tomorrow. By definition, you're only going to have so much time to listen to and process this whole album. You got to just sit down and punch it out as best you can. And there's no way that I'm going to say the same thing after two weeks or a month with a record that I would after one day. I mean, unless the record is just whack. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Anything, anything that deserves to get listened to, you're always going to want more time. So that, I think that's always been just a limit of the, the timetable that you work on in old school media, for sure. It's not that different in new school media. I basically, I just stop. I don't really want to do reviews as much for new albums because if I can't do it on Friday or Saturday, oh, right. it is, yeah, because you got to, you got to get it up while that's going to get clicked. But it's exactly right. the same reason that they wanted you to do it on, but I had yeah, to yeah. make my own right. deadline, right? Because I saw the number difference. Yo, by Sunday, dude, it's half the volume of Friday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Sunday, right. I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, with my video, I wasn't doing record reviews, but with all the video work I've done, if I'm doing something topical related to the news, like it was so much better working independently than when I worked for a company like Fusion or something like that. Cause Fusion, they want me to get it to them on Thursday at noon. And then they bring in their art department to make cards and all this other shit. It comes out uh, a day and a half later. By then it's already too late. It's not getting clicks now. Like you got to get it up as quick as possible. I know that hustle yeah. for sure. Mm. And then the um, other... you know what though, like Sorry. Jay, you I think you skipped ahead. Like let's get let's yeah, get. Yeah, we definitely to the sidetracked. Oh, yeah, definitely. I, was I being... want to get to your. Yeah, no, I, I want to jump out the hip -hop. That's the no, we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> go through the whole life. I like, was just being self indulgent because that was fucking interesting for me on a very personal level for other reasons. Yeah. Like it was just no, really cool. And I saw that, and I, I'm I wasn't gonna interrupt your. You know what I mean? Like yo. Well, how often do I get to yeah, talk absolutely. to a guy who but, does similar things like that? It's so cool. But I will not lie. Like, for me, right? Like, selfishly, for my purposes, like, it's been amazing learning my friends' life stories. Mm. You know? Like, it's just like... I know. We get it. We like, get into it. I didn't it. know that. And it's just like... It's because we don't ever... Like, we talk so superficially sometimes when we're around each other without even realizing it. It's just like, yo, about whatever's going on at the moment, Jay Spoon and me used to hang at a lot of battle events. And yeah. so, I mean, we would hang outside of that too, but like, you know, um, I just feel like I get to learn and know things about you guys that I just had no idea about. So like, yeah, I want to get back to the life story. All right. I <laughs> hear you. I hear you. I just, um, <laughs> It's not often. Anyway, so yeah, basically, we're still in your youth growing up in hip hop. Um, I'm curious, though, if at that time there's a couple other questions that need to be asked. Um, I've been told everybody's dancing at this era, so it's silly to even ask if you were dancing. But I must still because, you know, there's always going to be somebody that says, no, were you a dancer at this time? If we go through other elements, you know, are you into the breaking or anything like oh, that? Oh, I was never. I was never. A, you know, I could just do the basic. <laughs> I did a little, you know. <laughs> sort of uh, break into electric boogaloo parody in my grade school talent show. But I was never a big dancer. You know, I was the nerd who wanted to stand by the DJ and study and whatever was the equivalent of that in my younger days, you know, before I was hanging out with DJs. I was, I was definitely, you know, I'm all, I'm, I'm like an introvert, reclusive, sit in the corner reading the book, dude. So I'm like, I'm studying the music. I'm nodding my head to it in my headphones, but I'm not, I'm not a get out on the dance floor type. 
So I'm going to assume As far that. as elements, you know, I was beatboxing. I was learning the DJ. You know, I was writing my, my bars, 16 bars once every six months or so. Did you ever? So that answered a question that came up before you even got to the show, before we even got to the show, when we were um, playing your videos. Uh, I believe Ishmael said uh, that he he was like this guy's got to be a rapper just from hearing <laughs> how you were speaking. That's true, you know. So that answered like uh, uh, the question whether or not you know you 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 were rapping. You were rapping back then. Yeah, I definitely dabbled. You know, it's one of those things. If life had gone differently, I would have loved for it to be the main thing I did. But you know, I just life took me in other directions where that was just something I dabbled in here and there mm-hmm. while I was still blessed to be in the culture, you know, doing the radio show and other things. But yeah, you know, that's always been, and uh, uh, you know, an, an itch I, I want to scratch. There's still one more uh, avenue that we didn't even talk about one time, and that has to do with the drying, which I attribute to graffiti drying. It's just generalized. Are you into that kind of stuff as well? Yeah, no, I just don't have the tech. I don't have the physical skill to, to draw well. So, you know, I always had a lot of respect uh, for graffiti writing, but yeah, I was never a practitioner of that. But the, the dance, dance and 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 uh visual art elements i was i was an observer and student listen another one that you're missing is that in new york city like there was there's even some people that felt and considered like fashion was like one of the elements oh, facts. of, We've of, gone of down that. That, the culture yeah. that's because, definitely um, true and that's definitely another one i did not partake in <laughs> usually it's the ones who draw that are really more you'll, you'll notice a correlation between the ones who draw and the ones that are in the fashion I've noticed that a little bit. I might not, it's not hard facts yet. I'm trying to like still piece it together, but so it, it makes a lot of sense, but that's cool. So were you interested in being a DJ off the jump or is that like something that developed as you got more into music? But more importantly, uh, usually at some, in, in your life, there's this moment early on, we, we placed it around puberty where you hear a track at a moment and you're like, music changes for you. It goes from being this thing in your surroundings and it becomes this thing you care about where you like hear a song you're like no this is different what is this do you remember like that moment in your world yeah i mean there's there's two or three really pivotal early ones you know i think the first track that really made me feel like i was in the hip hop was um eighth wonder by the sugar hill gang um and then, you know this is like i had heard uh rapper's delight planet rock those other like right around the turn in 1980 records and i was like these are cool but something about that eighth wonder beat, like that funk was like, oh, oh, I remember I was at this girl uh, named Tengamana's birthday party from grade school and uh, eighth wonder came on while we were all like drinking our Kool-Aid and eating the cake. I was like, what is this? I said, no, okay. So, and then the next one, not surprisingly, is The Message, uh, Melly Mel and Duke Booty, RIP, who just passed. Um, and that's one, you know, my father, that's one my father and my, I connected on he it was actually my father who went and bought the message 12 inch because you know as as a poet he connected with it on that level because you know because it was a record where it was really functioning poetically and saying something uh, so he I remember him bringing that home and us sitting and listening listening to it together and that I think for so many people was like okay this hip-hop thing is capable of really expressing something and, and doing some substantive art here um, and then another one that was super pivotal, um, was, uh, run DMC sucker MCs. Okay. Um, I remember the first time I was, and I think, you know, I think right if, if you weren't around at the time, I think it's hard to understand how huge run DMC was, um, like for everyone who had grown up on all the old school shit up until then, when sucker MCs came out, it was like, I remember vividly the first time I heard it, like, what the fuck? Because it's I can just tell you, like as a, as a kid that grew up with like the like the first I guess generation, had, like too young for it, right? Mm-hmm. Like when I did go back and like do like the you know what we have to do you know back then and do your knowledge and and and, and like sit and listen to those albums. When I heard that and like uh, paid in full, um, uh. uh it just was like, yo, this is another, this, this hits. Thing. Right. It was like, like the, the whole because it's so it, like hard. Yeah, it hits hard. <laughs> it's, it's those stripped hard. down it's drums just... and the way that they're spitting over it. It's like, 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was like that night. I was like, okay, this this hip hop thing is my thing. Like it was like my life path was there. The first time I heard Sucker MCs, That's and that so- was like, and it was kind of like, I think Run DMC are a little older than me, but. I wasn't quite old enough. Like I wasn't at Sedgwick and Cedar in 74. Yeah, yeah. So those old school heads, like those were like the shit that got popping a little bit before me. Run DMC was like, this is me, my generation might be like, this yeah. is how we're doing this hip hop shit. Like that was what clicked right away when I, when I heard Sucker MCs for the first time. Like, it's crazy to hear you like have that reaction. Cause I know about it from like documentaries on YouTube and people talking about how Adidas got popularized and things like that. Right. But to like hear you just say it like, nah, this song dropped, I heard it and it was like, what the fuck? That's something that I can resonate with, but like not necessarily exactly the same, you know, like I get it, but, um, that's fucking, that's crazy. Like it didn't exist. And then you heard that and with the idea of youth and shit, right? right that's big too because i'm 12 years old and this white rapper takes over the world (laughs) so i actually have a little moment that's kind of like what the fuck to me where i said that's different that's actually like kind of big and um so yeah that's that's so nifty that you brought up the age thing and the relatability because i never would have put two and two together like that with regards to that level of connection with it so you see that happen and it inspires you and then you're part of this entire wave like you are the original youth wave of this shit yeah i mean you know or the second one at or least the second one fair enough fair enough to be more it's important to be accurate with that shit <clears throat> yeah and you know the first wave of, of people who are getting to know the music and it's recorded like recorded hip-hop music i was definitely in in the first wave of people who got to know it that way that's crazy so like at that point, do y'all start like buying records? Does it become more and more popular? Like, how does your life plan into this? Are you already like, I got to be a DJ at this point? Or because it was cool oh, that you brought up the beat. A lot of people don't bring up the beat is the thing that snares them. So that was fascinating. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's the whole sound, but just how stripped down and raw the beat is and the way they're spitting over it. It was like nobody thought the, the shit that we call old school. Nobody thought it was old school until Sucker MCs came out. And then suddenly mm. everything else, oh, shit, Treacherous 3 is old school now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Today is like, it's like, it's like, like BC and AD. Like, oh, this is the new it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, it's, it's this or bust. Like, it can't be that, right. that we were doing before. It's got to be this now. Okay. Like, exactly. You know? Right, right, right. Like this, and that happens in waves. Like, when Rakim, KRS, Kane, G-Rap came out, the same thing happened. Like, now Run DMC is old school. Like, okay, this is the blueprint now. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I guess if you're around over time, you get to see the blueprint get fine-tuned and remade and then a new standard is set. Yeah, That's really fascinating. And I'm glad that you're just framing it like that because it kind of shows that, you know, I think we're very, like, big with this concept of golden era. When we talk about it loosely up here, when we, not, not everywhere, but internets and stuff, like, Yo, like, I don't think people realize how many sub eras are part of this alleged golden era time period that people stamp on it. And I think you're kind of bringing a lot of focus into that. Like, a- another pivotal thing is that court case that, like, ended sampling in 94. Like, that changed yeah. hip hop forever. Oh, that's funny you say that because I almost, yo, hold on a second. Let me come back. Right <laughs> I, I have a prop that's apropos for that. What's what a, a, an amazing, great thing about Jay Smooth is he's like, a uh, low key um, uh, amateur collector. I don't want to say professional and and like put too much like obligation on him, but like he essentially like saves a lot of amazing stuff. So when I was looking for what shirt I was gonna wear, I almost wore my Bismarck E. I got a doo doo shirt. <laughs> this is the promo T shirt. <laughs> This is a promo T-shirt from the album that led to that court case. <laughs> the, first, the first single off that album was Toilet Stool Rap, a.k.a. I Got a Doo-Doo. I didn't wear it because I didn't want to have three hours of I Got a Doo-Doo on your stream. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was like one of my most prized shirts that I never actually wear. I, now I wish I had worn it. But yeah, definitely that, <laughs> that, that uh, who was it? Gilbert O'Sullivan suing uh, Bismarck E. Yeah, for you and alone again naturally. Yeah, that's that that right at the end of the '80s is is a big paradigm shift for sure. 
All right, so mm -hmm. let's go back to you though, or Flacco's gonna kill me because I love the hip hop stuff, but I know he's gonna be like, you didn't talk about that stuff. I told, you know, I I hear you, Flacco. So talked about your transition in high school. What's going on a little bit? I guess we have moved on to about let's say middle school. I don't know. You have a middle school. For me, it goes from primary to high. There's no middle. Yeah, actually, I went to a, like kind of a hoardy. I was one of the scholarship kids at this hoardy chorty private school who was like too cool to have a middle school. So I just had seventh grade to twelfth grade all in in the same. That's some Canadian shit right there. <laughs> um, so were you involved in stuff over there, like in terms of pursuing music, or are you just a fan at this time? Like, what's going on in your life with regards to your passions? Have you developed a dream yet? Um. Yeah, uh, I mean, I was definitely deeply immersed in it, and I think you know having that private school that kind of culture shock uh you know class-based collision of being one of the scholarship kids from the hood at, at fieldston which is like one of the elite private schools here in new york i think that is one of the things that drove me deeper into the culture as a kid who was like a, a shy introverted kid who didn't feel like you fit in generally then i'm around all these like super elite rich kids and don't know how to fit into this environment at all like being able to immerse myself in hip hop and just study this and feel a part of this, even from afar. Like, it's not like I'm out at the park b-boying or I'm too young to be going to clubs and, you know, going to clubs in the mid late eighties was a whole different thing than going to a hip hop show. Now, like you had to have your people with you and be ready for whatever. So I was definitely not ready to be doing that. So it was, so it was just in an indirect way through immersing myself and studying the music um, just soaking in everything I could about the culture was something I was doing throughout my high school years. And I kind of became known within the high school as like a representative of the music. Like I was the kid who was making the pause button mixtapes um, for people who What's a pause me button too. Mixtape. For people me too. Who got the time to get to know me and would find out about that. So that yeah, sort of, it gave too. me a bit of a role. And then I, you know, I started doing my radio show in my oh, senior year of high school. You got to pause there. Uh, yeah, yeah. What's a pause button mixtape? I think I know what it is, but just in case, you should explain it stills. Yeah. So if you didn't have turntables, which I did not, which answers your question about DJing, I just I didn't have the equipment for that and couldn't afford to buy it. like twelve or twelve hundreds are very expensive, as you may know. Yeah. I wasn't. I didn't have nearly that type of budget. So if you didn't have turntables, you would make a pause button mixtape, which is, um, if you're recording something on a cassette tape, if you press stop. And then you press record again, it makes a noise. Like there's a little blank. But, but what you learn is if instead of stopping, you're recording and then you press pause, it doesn't make any noise. And if you press pause exactly on the beat and then you unpause exactly on the beat in a different place, it comes back on exactly on beat. Mm. So what that means is you can slowly, meticulously build, build a, a, a type of mix where everything yeah. is on beat together kind of like you would if you were DJing and mixing the tempo. So if you were willing to put in the time, you know, it's like, you know, the, you know those videos where someone laid down like 10,000 dominoes and then they knock it down. You know, it took them like a day and a half to make that, but you watch it happen in a minute and a half. Mm -hmm. That's what a pause button mixtape was like. Like mm -hmm. just bit by bit, or it's like, you know, stop motion animation where you moving it a little bit and it takes mad long, um, but you put it together and then it just flows. Like that's, that's what pause button mixtapes were like you know the poor the poor man's djing that if you really yes, work yes, it, yes, it <laughs> was. i'm so glad you, you really shared that work, it, it could sound like you were really doing something that's a big time yeah, knowledge for, nugget for real like for I, all of us who couldn't afford i couldn't afford my right. parents were not they were not like like back then like no hip-hop is like that's your like thing whatever but like you're not we're not spending money on this like, you don't get to, like, have this equipment. You don't get to, like, you know, have anything that you can record on, like a microphone or nothing. Like, I didn't even know because I didn't know about, like, turning the headphone into, like, the yeah, microphone yeah, yeah, yeah. thing. Like, yeah, I didn't yeah. even have friends that were up on that. So I didn't even have that advantage of, like, making my own little, you know, make, you know raps at home on, on, a, on a tape. Like, I didn't even get to have that advantage. So like pause, like pause tapes was like, that's what I had. And that I had to refine that art. Right. As like, as like, 
best as I could because that was going to be the thing that was like, yo, Ray makes some good tapes, you know? Yeah, exactly. All right, and then you would sell those? No, 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 no. I mean, some there may be some people out there that are doing that, but for me, it was just like so. Like in my friend group, people knew that I made these tapes, and even you know, it might just be for myself. Like I, mm-hmm. and it's you know, sort of a precursor to doing a radio show, like spending all this time building something and curating it. I like that. I like that you shared that. It's real cool. Uh, we definitely got a comment that was flat out. That should become a clip. Like that's how interesting it is because we didn't grow up like that a lot of us i mean i'm already in cd land we're talking mp3 discs is my high school right so like to me it's like and why it's important is if we look at the music today and especially some of the conversations in the big game happening between older and younger heads i don't think there's an understanding of like these kind of obstacles you faced versus me hitting control r yeah (laughs) yeah 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 yeah, non-destructive <laughs> editing is amazing. If you if you grew up doing something like pause button mixing or even uh, editing, like I, I learned how to edit on reel to reel tape with a razor blade, and you got to think real hard about every choice you make because you can't Wait. undo. <laughs> Literally, they would cut things out and, and reattach it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's big, man. And that's that's what I don't think people understand about a lot of that early stuff, like what the bomb squad was doing on nation of millions. Like they don't have any of this technology we have today to just move a million sounds here and there, and then start over, rethink it, try a million different options. Like they were in the studio with all these reel to reels, like each person controlling one. And like you, when you had to do that with analog equipment, there was a level of ingenuity that had to come to it that, uh, I mean, not saying that that's better <laughs> by any means. Believe me, once I could do digital editing, I never look back. No, but uh, it, it, think, it does take a lot, right? What you're right. saying. Right. And, and I think of- constraint sends your creativity down a certain path that, like, absolute freedom yeah. with your tools doesn't give you. But it's also more than that, right? Like, you re- you know, one time my sound engineer and I, we worked at the same day job. And he looked me flat in the eye and said, back in the day, they had to practice. Um, to the point of precision before showing up in the studio because it costs too much. And I can tell you flat out, you are not ready sometimes. Yeah, In yeah, front yeah. of the whole room of people and shit. But that hit me hard. And it's like kind of in that point, you can't be chopping up reels and shit, which is permanently fucking some shit up forever and ever and ever um, without literally probably storyboarding that motherfucker and a bunch of other right. shit that we would never think to even bother with now. Because why bother? Just smoke a joint and fucking go around with it. Right, right, right. And, you know, I mean, you know, like I was saying with the evolution of the music, there's always going to be pros and cons. Like there's real obvious pros to being being able to edit digitally. But I think it's a blessing to be around long enough to have learned the old way and then apply that way of thinking about the form to the new technology. I wonder. Yeah, I think there's a, I think there's value in that, too, because you see it happen in other like art forms. Right. So like in horror movies, like, they're still trying to move back to, like, fic- prosthetic stuff. Right, like and, practical like, effects, exactly. Practical like, effects, like Mad yeah. Max Fury Road. Like, we're going to yeah. have as many practical effects as possible yeah. and hitting harder than uh, most yeah. of the movies that are all CGI. So right? when you enhance the digital, like, if, if you're, like, making the already huge explosion you're doing in real life a little bit digitally bigger... It's just like, who's going to care? Like, that's like such a like little bit fib lie that it's just like, if you just made the explosion better, like, I'm not mad at you. Like, that's even doper. Like, yeah, that's incredible, you know? And you see that happening in that. And, so. and, and, and obviously there's super dope shit that's all CGI too. It's just like knowing what mm-hmm. works. Yeah, for, mm-hmm. for, for which story no, but I, I appreciate it also just on the level of effort because I think that's where the, the big contrast comes is like time, honestly. It took so much longer to make that record. Like now, you can watch these guys literally machine work it. Like they, right. can, like some of these beat makers I know can literally make five beats a day, and they all sound different. And it's pretty fucking yep. incredible when you think about how the volume of music that can get created today, that literally could not get created back in the day. So like, it's weird how the production cost of music is dropped to like fucking nothing, but the marketing budget skyrocketed. <clears throat> yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway. And there's just so much more hip hop 
in the world. Like I used to be able to go to the music factory in Times Square and look at the wall of 12 inches. And that was like all the new 12 inches that came out this week. Now, like that many songs comes out every hundredth of a second. Yeah, that's a crazy thought to think about the actual rate per second. I never done that before. Wow, that's a huge uh, volume. All right, so you're back doing your, your push tapes, pause tapes, pause tapes that you were making, creating your curation love, digging through crates already because you guess you already have to be doing that. Or was it tapes at, at you're best doing? I can't, you know, on my high school allowance budget. I'm buying vinyl um, and then using that to make pause button mixtapes and whatever else. And, you know, just sitting sitting and listening to the music all the time. Cause you know, I grew up in kind of a dysfunctional family, especially on my father's side. He had a lot of demons he was working with. So in that unpleasant home environment, I would like come home from school, go straight to the headphones and just like lose myself in the music, um, just like to get away from the world around me. So it was like non, like not nonstop studying of the music. And then of course we had, uh, back then you couldn't just hear hip hop on the radio all the time. You, you had like Friday and Saturday night from 9 p.m. to midnight, you had Kiss and BLS. Those were like the the hip hop, the hip hop segregated areas. And then you had the underground shows like uh, 105.9, you could hear a little on like the awesome two um, DNA Hank Love show. Like there was a certain times Friday and Saturday, you could listen to hip hop. So religiously, Friday, Saturday night, I'm there with my headphones, recording, studying everything that's going on. That's definitely a big, that that Friday, Saturday night, hip hop radio experience was definitely a big part of it. And then uh, video music box as well. Big part of growing up in New York City was that like early radio. I remember like my parents were, my father was like into this thing where like, he'd like take us on like a driving tour of like Times Square. <laughs> <laughs> like, as a family, we just drove through Times Square, like, oh, look, look at it, how crazy it is down here, you know? But, like, I'd always be super fascinated, and then, like, they'd be, they play, like, they, I don't think that they realized that they were, you know, like, wanting to, because those stations kind of played the, like, right, they played the been around the world, nah, yeah, yeah, <laughs> in the daytime, right? And then right. at night, that's when that was so like they didn't realize right. in the daytime you know? in like yeah every time except friday and saturday from nine to twelve it was just like r b it was like the whispers which is dope i'm not knocking any of that but except for like there'd be like one run dmc song one curtis blow whatever were the two or three biggest hip-hop pop hits at that time by the pop hit standard for then um yeah they would be but otherwise you weren't hearing any like you know, Eric B and Rakim, I know you got soul. You had to tune in Friday night starting at 9 p.m. Yeah. Okay. That's like for me, it's like I'm absorbing this all. For you, it might be like whatever what I look like, but I'm just like sitting here going, this guy is like living history. It's a little like cool when I have those moments because for me, I, I feel like I would watch you on YouTube and I'm talking to you, which is just <laughs> ethereally cool to me. Like, like I became a fan of you this week. For real, I didn't know who you were before. No disrespect or anything. It's just how it is in life. Flacco said you were fucking the most interesting, smartest person. So I started watching your little videos, and I'm like, no shit. He is the most interesting, smartest person. Um, I told him I told him to go friend you on Facebook. I was like, yo, I won't ever tell you that with any, like, a fellow guest. Like, they're the did, homies. But, like, did, did we friend up? No, Let me know if the request is still in there. I'll, the I'll request is still in there. I figured I would wait till after this conversation to follow up on that, because otherwise, who the fuck am I? I understand you have a I lot told of him, Facebook I told friends. Him to, I told him to friend you because I was just like, that, like, it, you improve my feed. You know, like, there's mm. certain people that improve the feed that changes up, like, what you're seeing in your everyday day-to-day, -day, you know? And that's why, like, you know, like, I try to, like, have these like friends that like are not just the same echo of opinions and like ways of looking at things you know yeah i also think your just insight is like i could just learn about how to navigate certain murky waters smarter you're just like that guy you're like the best barometer i've encountered on the internet so and i'm saying that for real reals i'm not one to be hyperbolic with compliments i like to be apt one of the best I've encountered on the internet, facts. And I spent a lot of time on YouTube. Oh, so, much appreciated. So it's like just... 
I almost feel like I want to shut up and let you talk as much as possible. And then I forget <laughs> I'm hosting and I got to talk to, <laughs> but, um, not nah, for real. Like it's, it's a really a, bl- a blessing. Everything you've said has been like, yo, I got to remember this and absorb it and think about it later because it's that insightful. But for you, it might not be that because it's your life and shit. I notice some people don't think their life is as interesting as I think their life is. And that's just usually how the world works. But now nah, all of this is super interesting, like super duper interesting. Um, yeah, and that's you know that's that's what I love about how we can all connect online, um, which has become obviously so important over the last year. But it's that's one of the biggest lessons I've been able to take in later years as I did more work online is that the parts of your experience that are mundane to you are always going to be fresh to other people. So you you know you should it's very easy to underestimate the value of telling your story. Yeah. And yours has already dropped some serious insight into like furthering a few of our context and understanding of hip hop in its entirety, just on your life story so far that I've heard. So that's kind of big for me. You know, it makes me better at what I aim to do with my life. And that's a huge blessing that, that oh, you did. Well you can ask Flacco. I'm very consistently this. I don't know. I'm not a bullshitter like that. Um, no, but let's go back to your story, though. So you're in high school and you're doing all your stuff. Uh, when do you, like, develop the migration from this mixtape, uh, push tape, mixtape thing to, like, I'm going to be a radio guy? Yeah, so when I was uh, 16 years old, um, it was, like, summer break. Um, and my mom wanted me to find something to do over the summer. Um, and I applied for a job at uh, McDonald's by here. And they, I, I didn't get the job. I got turned down. So um, me, my, both of my parents and I, I grew up listening to this radio station, WBAI, like in, in the 80s, throughout the 80s, which is like this left wing, uh, grassroots community, kind of hippie, radical station. It's like the station that Abby Hoffman and Bob Dylan used to be hanging at. It's where Malcolm X would come back in the days, like it was where the radical counterculture was always represented, like this grassroots station that most people don't know about. But if you're like, if you're politically minded and into any kind of counterculture, also be it music or whatever, like BAI was like the underground radical hippie shit that I grew up on. So there was a producer there uh, named Anthony Sloan who was looking to get an intern that summer of 89. Um, And my mom heard him say, yeah, I'm looking for an intern. So I went down um and anthony had me read something like one of the evening news stories for that night and i was very i was very good at uh reading something by sight like i could i could read something out loud seeing it for the first time and get through it without making any mistakes so he was like okay you bet you're on um so i very quickly got you know as a very really isolated introverted kid at that time who didn't fit in at high school and kind of felt like maybe there's never going to be somewhere I could connect with other people. Like I got welcomed into this WBAI community and got to study under all these people I already admired from listening to the radio station. Um, And long story short, within a couple of years of being there, um, they were looking to start a hip hop show so they could reach a younger audience. And they were originally trying to get Karis one to do the show, but he was like too busy or flaked out or something. Um, so I put in a proposal in my senior year of high school, like, uh, 1990, um, for a radio show. And I was, you know, I was, I was a very good writer. And when they got the proposal, they, they accused my mentor, Anthony Sloan of writing the proposal for me. Cause they thought it was too good for a high school kid to have written. Um, and then when they, when they confirmed it was actually me, was like, okay, I guess, you know, we'll give this kid a shot. Um, yeah, so that's like, super nifty. It's crazy. Yeah, super fascinating. And yeah, it was, and it was, was, yeah, and it was like this was not an environment where they really respected hip hop or young people. Like, yeah, no, clearly they, not. They, right? they understood. They understood that hip hop had this sort of political element, and they appreciated it for that. But the idea that like you should actually respect hip hop as an art form, as a form of music, they didn't really get at all. So it was like they kind of halfway respected me, but also thought it was weird. Like a lot of people at the station thought it was weird. They were giving this kid a show. Um, so I definitely came in want, needing to prove myself to them. So it's fascinating about your story. It's just, I've had the luck, the idea of lucky moments, you know, the luck yes. factor 
it seems to just be opportunity and preparedness. That's all That's it the ever thing, really right. is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you it's proved your preparedness, right. and evidently you're a reader uh, uh, from that era. Yeah, you know, just because we might forget. Do you have it? Do you have books out? And do you have plans of writing books? I don't yet. That's definitely uh, on my long term to do list. Something I haven't gotten to yet. But yes, yeah, something I definitely hope to do. You're one of the first people I've talked to who I would have just bought the book on the spot practically. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I'm a, I read that shit. That's why it's there. I'm fucking flexing. Yeah, no. <laughs> you should really do that, Jay. No, for real. I man. feel you. And do many of them. All of them. Just, just man, yeah. dude, you're like fucking New York Times bestseller publishing, blah, 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 slapped all over easily, my promotional easy, material. Easily, I'm not even, dude, I swear. Like, easily, easily, easily. I'm telling you. Yeah, absolutely. Just the way you, everything, man. I eat that shit up, man. I dropped $30 on that shit. Wow. I'm not going to buy your fucking album. I'll buy your book, though. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. There's no plastic. You know, plastic's big, man. That's a big thing for me, actually. So, <laughs> your book. I'm going to get that to my kids and shit one day. And then they're going to get that. that. You know, it's from fucking mm-hmm. generational shit. Anyhow. Uh, so you, you basically create the luck in your life by being prepared and obsessed and taking a Yeah, that's route. like, yeah, like it's, it's, you know, I'm sure there's many people who were just as into hip hop as I was, you know, were probably good talkers, good readers, you know, studious nerds like me but just didn't happen to have someone come into their life that let them uh take advantage of it and build something so that you know there's definitely there's always blessings and and good fortune involved but then there's also the work like there's also a lot of people who are gonna have that door open and they're not going to have been prepared and they're not going to be ready to do the work so it's, it's a combination of both like you said so i just wanted to give you your flowers on being ready because uh, I don't think a lot of people give themselves the credit for being the kind of adolescent that did that due diligence because I most certainly was not, sir, and I suffered for it the rest of my life. So the fact that you pulled that shit off is something that should be celebrated so that people can admire that type of ethic at youth. Yeah, I, I, you know, and I would say to anyone who gets started later, I don't think there's any shame in that. No, either. not, not like at all. Be, not being not able not. to have that joy of discovery at any point in life is dope. Any point, exactly. But my grandfather was really big on like imparting on me, like like out of all the knowledge and wisdom that my grandfather imparted on me, like one of them that like really stuck was like that. Like it doesn't matter how old he was getting, he could always learn something new. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was so willing to learn new things. And that was rare back then. I remember that. You know, That's like why I, you're like, I, I hate when people are snobs about like some 20 like some 20 year old doesn't know about yeah, three feet high thing. and rising and they're like how do you not know that shame on you like, like i wish I, I wish i could be discovering albums you like know, that for the know, honestly, I'm, I'm, happy, honestly, I'm happy for you it's mad bless it is so good to do it i, yeah. I spent four mm-hmm. years religiously week over week doing classic fucking hip-hop album we did yeah. 100, 150 albums so far of digging through the crates uh so like yo i hear you and I wasn't trying to put it from the point of view of like shaming anyone. It's more like right. to the parents. Yeah, who, no, I know what you mean. But it's like actually more to go more pointed with it. It's to the parents that unfortunately I, w- I was with who like went the opposite and just fucking killed the dreams and shit. Like, nah, wow. let that kid fucking do the things yeah. and get that practice in and, and let yeah. that nurture. Because, yo, I still did what the fuck I wanted just way later in life. And it was like yeah. 10 times as hard is the truth of it. So that's why I wanted to like, I, I I do that a lot. I try to focus on these incredible adolescent accomplishments when they arise because I want people to know that it's cool. Or at least I think it's cool. Even if yeah, and you, and you might cool. not feel like it's cool at the time, <laughs> but, but later on, you know, if you have the opportunities to build on it, you'll, you'll be able to look back and recognize. So that's blessed to me. So what's it like to be like, uh, uh, I guess, the er seminal hip hop show at a radical radio station? It was it was an amazing experience because, you know, I'm I'm a teenager who's still like finding my identity, finding my place in the world, like coming to believe I could have a place in the world from from being accepted by the WBAI community. And then once I start the radio show, New York's underground hip hop community is really welcoming to me um bobito garcia who people know from the bobito stretch armstrong show he reached out to me real early in 91 i started my show in february of 91 
within a month or two of that, Bobito invited me to his office at Def Jam. He worked at Def Jam back at that time and just like took me under his wing, connected me with all the record labels so I would get all the new releases in the mail. Bobito connected me with the Source magazine. That's why I started writing for them like in June of 91, within months. That's so fucking cool. You, so you yeah, basically... so it was like immediately after my whole, like it was a whole teenage experience of like, maybe I'm just not supposed to fit in anywhere to like radio and hip hop were like, yes, you, you're a part of this community and, we, and you're gonna contribute. And like just welcome with open arms and get to represent this thing. And it's, it was like, oh, there's some big yeah, truths in what you're saying became, though. Yeah. So if we all just pause for a second and go in a slight different direction with this whole like idea, we take Jay Smooth, who is arguably a brilliant man today. And not, not that arguable, it's facts. Uh, but we look That's... at that youthful journey of how hip hop embraced the youthful spirit. And the impact that it has all this time later with the growing up Jay Smooth being the kind of person he is today. And then sometimes I don't think, uh, especially in my age group of millennial, that we are the best at accepting the youth culture and what they're trying to do. So it's super something we should all reflect on, how we treat the youth culture a little bit. Because, yeah, it's really powerful to let the youth be creative. Yeah, I can tell you also, like, I mean, that's how Jay Smooth and me and uh, a lot of the guys around us linked up was battle rap right like keeping his finger on the pulse of like like this is where the underground is moving like this is this is a direction that like people are heading in droves and jay smooth was just like um he's there you know like he was there at all the events like keeping his finger on the pulse you know yeah and it's you know i'm always gonna have complicated relationship with battle rap because a lot of the content Mm -hmm. is like I, uh, you know i'll watch lots of battles but it's very limited how much i could share to my social media sphere and my audience yeah. the content no we like, had that talk i was right, right, holding right. about but, that I, but yeah the positive that. aspects of it i always really admired like the creativity the ingenuity the commitment to mm -hmm. perfecting this craft and innovating when you know nobody's actually getting rich off of this and just the energy that's in the room at these battle events like that's that's being at a hip hop event 10 years ago. And it's really hard to recapture at any regular rap event, but the battle scene still has that spirit. And I love, that's the very last thing I did before the pandemic hit was I went to uh, Sarah Khanna's last uh, PRISM event. Mm -hmm. and just, just soaked in that, that like grassroots, which uh, for people who don't know, that's like an all LGBTQ battle league that Sarah Connor runs. Mm. Um, and I, yeah, that was like February. Yeah, yeah, exactly a year ago. That was the last thing I did was like soak in that flavor. So I love that. I, the more we can do like Sarah Khan is doing and like capture that, that essence without some of the content that I don't want to hear. I always love when that happens. Yeah, I respect that a lot, actually. Cause yeah, some, I've had complicated relationships with some of that content myself. It's yeah, not... I mean, you know, that's that's being a hip hop fan in general, right? That, you know, there's always going to be you love the art and you don't love everything people are saying. I had you to figure out like, how to it. I I went the route of trying to go through history to understand better because there's certain right. there's certain complicated realities attached to like let's say homophobia and hip hop that like are really linked to slavery that like a lot of people don't know about that make it weird. So I don't know a whole lot about it, but I know enough to know that it's really like complex and fucking weird. And there's a lot Very of- Very complex, nuance. So like, I don't know how to solve the problems, but I know that I can't judge it because it's certainly shit I didn't have to ever really go through or deal with. So I try to like keep a super fucking open mind to the fact that I wasn't around in these times and I don't necessarily know whatever. And even with battle rap, like, I'm not really in the environment that fostered any of this culture. So however it offshooted, I just have to like, remember that kind of guest in the house mentality because it's otherwise you're just going to judge. I think that's why it's an important thing to remember because it leads to judgment when you act like it's part of your home if you don't really understand it. Yeah, I know, you know, that's a big, that's a big part of my relationship with hip hop over the years that I've tried to bring into my work commenting on politics and racism and other stuff is like figure it th thinking about how you can communicate with people in a community you share and like talk to people you love who are saying things that you hate like how do i 
how do I try and talk to you about this set a counter example, like be in this space, setting a different example, try and communicate in a way that isn't just like something that honors the human bond that we have as members of this hip hop thing. Um, instead of just like you said some shit that I hate, go fuck yourself, which someone has a right to do. That's why I don't be showing every battle rap video on my Facebook. Like you're within your rights to do that. But if you really want to be in this community, um, that's been around before you came into it and really love it and be a part of it. You know, I think sometimes you're going to want to think about how, how can I be in it and, uh, try to be an influence that's moving it in the right direction and communicate about the things I think people could do differently and like just have that disagreement and, and challenging each other, but from a place of mutual respect. Yeah. Yo, you're, you're Ooh. eloquent as fuck. <laughs> eloquent as fuck. No, I mean, I don't know how else to put it. My guy, like that was, yeah, no, nah, that should that be like, gymnastics, if, like if, dude. If, if Jay smooth was a rapper <laughs> and like, like having hashtags, you know, that are like tailored to him was like a thing that like he <laughs> focused on that it totally be like, you know, like a hashtag, like hashtag J smooth, hashtag eloquent as fuck. You know what I mean? <laughs> AF, like eloquent AF, like yeah, that's my fact. hashtag, <laughs> you know? Honestly, yeah, that was, that was like, you said a lot and you said it perfectly and you didn't even say fuck. So eloquent AF. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, super. Yeah, um, the, like the Namine thing doesn't apply with Jay Smooth. Didn't even you know? bother. Like, I'm the, like, yeah, there's, there's, Jay yeah, no, Smooth. absolutely. I saw that you did him. Absolutely. Like, I was like, there's a, a there's a running thing theme yeah. on the show, you know, of like, you know, he's talking to a lot of New Yorkers that I'm introducing them to, and, you know, um, we tend to say Namine a lot. And well, yeah, the, uh, the they used to, yeah. <laughs> On one of five point nine, they used to have I forget what the phrase was, but there was some phrase they would like ring a bell. <laughs> yeah, so, like the problem but, is, so, and, they, that, and they had a rule. They had a rule like when they interviewed an artist, and you were going to ask them, "So what? How do you describe yourself?" You couldn't use the word "real." <laughs> word. That word. was uh, that was well, uh, the Dirty Dozen he, show. Part of the show is like he does it not mean, you know, like he like, does it not mean. Up. So like, please explain, and um, and and that. And that I think that that comes in large part from doing radio for so long. You're thinking about how to flow in a certain way and listening to your own voice while you speak. I think over time you get more in a groove. Do you listen to yourself while you talk? Like, do you have your voice running through that? Yeah. As a radio person, I'm accustomed to that. Like, it would be weird to me if I wasn't hearing my voice. Wow. Weird. Wow. I didn't even so I have you. a, let me see if I. I, oh, I can't get it up to the camera, but I have a four track mixer that I have the mic plugged into so I could do it that way. Cause I know that's not, that's not how most webcam setups are. No, straight up. I'm in the same position you are, everything like that. I mean, I have a shore, right? So like, it, it's like plugged into the thingy, but I, I would be so distracted hearing myself that I've never even, I don't even do that's, it when I Yeah, I'm sure music. that's for most people, but for me, it's the opposite. Like when I started doing, when I left WBAI and started doing my radio show online, I had to figure out a way to feel like I'm in front of a mixing board and engineering. I was going to say to myself. mimic, to mimic. Like I don't feel, comfortable. Feel, I don't feel everything. comfortable sitting here talking if I'm not like, you know, in, in, in front of the, the hollow deck or whatever, running the starship enterprise, if I'm and, just in front of a mic and someone else is engineering, I like, I can't zone in. Oh, as yeah. somebody who's been on your show, I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, like, uh, knowing how, you know, like I would hear it on the headphones, you know, you hear the whole show. Right. That's going out on the air in the headphones, you know? That's crazy. So it's just like I'm I'm used to like a lot of those things, like uh that's where I got that that from where like I knew how to have the switch to like not curse because I'm like I'm going right. on on the homie show and it's going on, on FM. Right, and I have right. to be cognizant while at the same time being myself. And I don't want to get caught up in being one of those guys who's like and that actually used to help me maybe articulate myself better more, you know? And like recently when we, when I started doing interviews with Holden, I realized like, because my job uh, left the corporate setting and it's such a more relaxed environment, I've like fallen into this like very relaxed, natural dialect at all times. It's just like, what, why, why do I, I'm, I'm way more eloquent than this. But, it's but also like, I'm not even 
literally like the sentence will be like so i went over to this really specific location nah i mean like, how the fuck am i supposed to know that like i just i just remember it because i did one with nunzio and i'm like dude i have no idea what you mean and my boy laughed so hard when he saw that clip he's like i also didn't know and i realized nobody does but nobody says it I'm like, okay, let's do it. Let's roll this. Let's let's play this. I'll be that dude. Because <laughs> that's a hole in the market. Let's be real. Nobody wants to be the guy that's like, I oh, don't know shit. Tell me more. <laughs> um, All right, so we were at... Um, we're at the radio show. And, radio uh, show and working... You So Bobby, Bobby took know, something just, under. Yeah. And you uh, then, like, uh, after you introduced you to the source, then you... Started working there not long after as well. Yeah, I didn't do that for a long time, but yeah, I started uh, writing record reviews for the source. Um, I think you know, because I'm like 18 years old, this is a lot on my plate at once. So the writing kind of fell by the wayside after a while. But I was, yeah, this is early, early days. Um, I was working with an editor named Rob Tulo, aka Reef, one of the original Mind Squad, as they call it. And I used I to feel like, like that name is super familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah, if you look him up, you could connect a lot of dots. Like everyone who was a part of the squad back then went on to do important things for sure. Mm. So, so they would like, they would let me know what I was supposed to review. I'd get a cassette tape and I would like get on the bus and write out the review on loose leaf paper <laughs> on the bus down to like, I think the studio was on Houston Street. And I would go up and give it to them, and I, I'd uh, get my forty dollar check in the mail <laughs> for each review I wrote. <laughs> I reviewed. Wow, I'm trying man. to think of what I, re I reviewed. Loose MC Brief first album. Um, I reviewed uh, one of the Nice and Smooth records. I forget which one. Um, a few other joints okay. like that. Okay, that, that's serious though. That's so dope though. Yeah, it was. Yeah, just getting to be and that you know, just being in that office. You, with, you like, put that on your resume, you know, like that's, that's a nice, that's a really impressive, like, thing to have on your resume, you know, like, I wrote album reviews for The Source because, you know, I'm a trusted hip-hop trigger. And that's how that, like, the rest of that sentence goes to anybody hearing it who understands what the, like, you know, the context of that E, mm. you know, actually is. To be like, fair... I'm old enough to understand the context of that means because the source wasn't still, well, it might not have been good, but it was in Canada and it did play that role for Canada in its wishy washy way, which is possible. Yeah, I mean, why. I say there was still good work at the source done it was like, after the Benzino era, but he just killed like. You know what? I can remember vividly. I think I bought one one time and I remember opening it up and it was like 50 to 60% ads. And I was like, is this what magazines are? And I was like the first and only time I really ever did it. Cause I was like, this seems like a lot of money for like ads. And I mean, the content was good. It wasn't like the content was bad. It was just the display was very awkward. Yeah. And you know, I think that's partly just the economics of print publications got harder and harder over the years as well. I'm sure. Yeah, and I, I get it. I, um, I mean, I get it now. I didn't get it then. Um, and yeah, that was, yeah. So that was, yeah, I mean, I guess a lot of that was the last golden age just of magazines in general, right? As you yeah. know, so I was around to see when Vibe magazine first came out, when XXL first came out, um, and wrote wrote for each of them as well. It was the original source heads like uh, Reginald, Blaze. Reginald Dennis and all of them who first, first, first started XXL. Then something happened and they left and, and Elliot Wilson took over. Elliot Wilson from Ego Trip, another legendary magazine back then. Elliot Wilson, who I was criticizing earlier this week yes, on he social. Oh. <laughs> he, he, could, he could definitely be criticized. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know All who good. he is, but I know that I discovered that he, he uh, Fla uh, Liddy Bro Flacco is like beefing with him. And then. Uh, not beefing. That's a, that's well, beefing is a big word. <laughs> Twitter <laughs> agitating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I agitate people online. Period. Like, so, uh, that's 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 the kind of hip hop head I am. But um, <laughs> yeah, but like, I think as you describe more of these accomplishments, my respect for you like is doper. Like, I don't know if you're somebody like me, you look up to people that do crazy things in a field that you're doing things in, and 
so far you're hitting some goat tears in journalism for hip hop that like I think are fucking goaty as far as cool people for this shit goes that are still doing shit that's relevant today, man. Big respect. Yeah, I mean it's just as as someone who loves the culture so much, it just it couldn't be more of a blessing to have gotten to be in the room for so many different facets of how it evolved. Um just from just from knowing from the inside what what being in the source building felt like at that time. Like that's, there's certain types of knowledge you get from being in the room. Like that's one of the biggest blessings I've had is doing my radio show for so long, watching hundreds, thousands of artists freestyle or perform on the mic. Like there's, there's knowledge you absorb about the art of emceeing from watching someone sit in front of you <laughs> rapping. Like there's so many intangibles that you could never get from any amount of, listening to records or even watching someone on stage like what mastery looks like just on the most minuscule levels like being blessed to have a great MC named mr voodoo who started out as my intern went on to be a part of the natural elements crew like getting to watch him week after week get on the mic there's so many little things you learn these intangible things about like what mastery looks like and how it manifests so you, like you can only get if you're in the room to absorb those things Yo, that's a big play for the value of the live performance in the future as the big other debate of my life. Yeah. Is like, I mean, you, you can get that from on stage, but I think it has to be in a small venue, like if you're at the garden or something. That's real cool. That's why events like end of the week, you know, when it could be done out in person, um, were always so dope. Or like every event that they would have at the New York and Poets Cafe. Mm, that's nifty you say that. I've mostly ever only encountered hip hop live in like the smallest of events, and it was always blessed to me. I saw Wu Tang Clan at this big stadium last uh, summer or something. Last su two summer, I don't know, whatever. And yo, it was not good in the big stadium. Yeah, it was it's not, not good. Hip hop is not naturally suited for that. There's people who could make it work, but it's much more naturally suited, in my opinion, for like the smaller the venue, the better. Like, in my radio studio <laughs> that's like 10 feet by 10 feet and you rhyme there like that to me is the ideal like all of my favorite performances i've ever seen were like people on the mic in my studio then the next thing after that which could be better because of the crowd dynamic you know that that can elevate it to another level but like small rooms like the new eureka and like let's say sobs even that's like a little big by these standards like the more intimate the setting is with you and the audience so yeah, the better that, live hip hop works to me. So I think you're tapping into some shit that's going to play out in, in a big way. Uh, I've been noticing that bars and the way a lot of things are going in it. So I'm trying to figure out what is it once live comes back and, you know, COVID ends and whatnot. But if what you're saying really holds true with that power, then like shit like chalet parties is really going to be popping and lit for a lot of the young peoples in ways that are, are nifty because it'll create a lot of that moment. Yeah, I mean, and I should say, you know, everything I'm saying applies to the forms of hip hop I came up on. There's so many different forms and incarnations. Nowadays, what yeah. Saying. What I'm saying might not be true for but styles. You're tapping into like some different human different connection shit that is mimicked by like tons of people that I talk to. Like, this is not an uncommon perception. This is more the common perception that I have with stuff with people. So, yeah. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, I mean, just, I just I want to be humble because, like, some of the younger generations are like, maybe Travis Scott is better in the stadium than he yeah, is. Travis at Scott SFB. is, I'm like, a guy who, stuff. like, but let's yeah. be real. Like, Travis, actually, I'm Travis, Travis for the stadium. Scott, man. So I, That's different. So I, I did this with a 17-year-old because uh, he ended up being somebody I was recommended, and he brought up Travis Scott as one of the only people he would go pay $90 for a stadium to, but it was because of all the extra he does he puts on that like balls to the wall show like of like everything he brought a fucking roller coaster with him and stuff but even that's kind of reminiscent of like that early era shit where you have dancers and you have all this other stuff that's like involved in didn't like some of these early crews literally have dancers as part of like the group and shit and then somewhere along the way that just kind of stopped happening and i don't know about yeah. that but that's a thing i know that once happened that stopped happening yeah it would like it would look weird <laughs> People look at it like it's weird now if if an MC can dance. <laughs> but back then, that was normal. You, you could dance and you had backup dancers with you. And we knew the names of your backup dancers. Big facts. It's super, like, like not the norm anymore. People, like, look at it like, yeah. 
What's what's that? Why right. why would that rapper know how to dance? Right, like, like like uh, what? Why not? Like what, 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 right, what, like what the, the baby had that video where he had a whole choreographed thing going, and that was like super innovative because it's so mm-hmm. rare to do it now. Yeah, I feel that. Or at least of a certain age group, because I feel like the youth are consistently surprising me. And as much as I think I know anything about the young ones, nah, I'm wrong on every front. That All of my preconceived notions about them are wrong, so I just take a blank slate approach with them now and assume that they're probably going to be better than I expect, so I should just be optimistic about them. But I totally feel that way about most of the people I know, so I hear what you're saying. Um that's real dope, though. So let's go back to your story because I love the fact that your tangents are this late. When your tangents are this late, it's just a testament to how interesting of a person you are and how great your brain is. That's just the facts of the situation. Um, but what's it like? Like, how long are you in the radio? I guess you went 27 years. I saw in a clip before you took a Friday night off, as I understand yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, as of yeah, my 30th anniversary of doing the Underground Railroad was previously this month. I didn't really do anything to celebrate because we're in pandemic. Um but yeah, I started, I, I came to BAI in 89. I started doing the Underground Railroad in 91. Um, and I left WBAI in what, 2018, I guess, and eventually started to show up again independently online. So yeah, like terrestrial radio, like 20, 27, 28 years or so doing that hip hop. is truly incredible. People don't do 28 years of anything successfully. And you know how I know it's successfully? Because you got a Patreon. With a hundred twenty eight dollar <laughs> tier, nobody has a hundred twenty eight dollar tier that doesn't feel that somebody might buy that shit one day. I don't know if people did, but I'm just saying, I loved it. Yeah, yeah. You, in my experience, people will do it, but they just they don't stay forever with that. Like people, nah. people who people who really want to give, like they'll do it for a few months. That's my experience, which is definitely a huge blessing that that I think comes from staying committed for a long time and like making choices where you favor the integrity of, of your work over like short-term opportunities, doing some shit you might not be as proud of, mm-hmm. get a check, but mm-hmm. people are not going to trust you as much because they didn't have the same integrity. <laughs> like I've always been that I'll stay broke and keep doing shit I love and really believe in, which is not a choice I'm recommending for everyone, but it's just like, I just don't have the temperament to, to be fake and try like act like I respect mm-hmm. people I don't respect. And there's downsides to that. Like you should, you should play the game to get yourself financial security. That's what you should do. I'm not saying be like me, <laughs> but I just never been. I never been able to do. It. Like, I could be living by humble means and doing shit that I love and be proud of and be good with that. And that the one plus is you build a relationship with an audience where people really respect what you do and want to support when they can. No, I really respect that. I mean, in my opinion, like you're you're in for a good time in the next decade is my opinion people like you are being highly favored by the world a lot more than other types of people in this uh as a service economy for creators as it evolves so uh it's fucking nifty um but let's go back to like the past a little bit more so you're in like 91 and you're going or over this course of time you're you're doing this source and then like what's going on in your life are you still trying to be like in music still like as a rapper are you just like committed to radio are you going on to other ambitions like what else is happening yeah i just you know because i was so young and i was still uh you know working out my identity kind of working through childhood trauma you know growing up in a family that had a lot of mental illness and addiction which was a part of me feeling so introverted like I could I mean I'm naturally introverted but that feeling that I was like a freak who couldn't fit in came a lot from unpleasant family experience so I was I think throughout my 20s I was basically just like going through an experience of growing up while doing the radio show and because I had to I had to move out of my dad's house because he was so unhealthy and I took over this apartment from my mom so I had to get a job to pay the rent here Um, So I got a job working at a group home up in Westchester. Um, So like from the age of, I think I was 19 when I, so for most of the nineties, I was an assistant teacher counselor at this group home upstate for uh, what they call emotionally disturbed kids, um, which is you just, you get classified that way. So you could get put in this institution. It usually means like you had a traumatic home life, like you, had a bad situation with your parents and you built up defense mechanisms to deal with that trauma. So then you couldn't fit in in school behaviorally. So you get sent to live in the group home. 
So that was a, the other big part of my formative years in the 20s was doing the radio show and my other hip hop things for the love of it and then earning a living from this really intense, deep job uh, working with these kids at the group home. And it wasn't until like, and I think I needed, I needed that time to sort of build up my sense of self, my self-esteem, um, my foundation so that like, I think when I hit my 30s, it wasn't really until then that I started trying to earn a living from my media and from representing the culture and doing my thing. Like in the 20s, I was basically doing hip hop for the love and working at the group home in the week. Yo, that is like big, right? Because it makes a lot of sense for the way you feel. If you had to see that all the time, like, and you're probably hearing the stories on repeat all the time. Right, like a people that are going through stuff, right? I would assume. Or... Yeah, I mean, and it's you. I learned so much. It was like we were all on an educational journey together because you learned so much from the kids just about trauma, how it affects you, how you overcome it. Like learning from the resilience that these kids have, the community they cobble together amongst themselves. That slow work of like building a rapport with these kids who like. They want to figure out every way to press your button and have a negative interaction with authority. But if you're patient and don't let them press your buttons, there, there's a real desire to have a positive relationship and uh, have like a different way to relate. Um, so that you, just having the patience to figure that out over time was like, I learned so much just about human nature, how to work on yourself, how to inhabit the world, how to build healthy community for people who, who have been through some shit. Uh, that, so that's like I don't talk about that stuff a lot, um, but that's that's definitely a big a big part of how I look at inhabiting the world and, and putting ideas out there and like building community around my media come, comes from that work with the kids. And it's been an amazing blessing being able to reconnect with a lot of those kids from the group home um, on Facebook, because when you work at a group home like that, like this is not a school where everyone graduates like there might be a graduation where like literally three kids graduate. For the most part, someone gets assigned to the group home randomly at some point in the year. And then one one day you come to work and that kid's not there anymore. You never know. Like kids are just coming and going. So wow. you 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 don't you don't be getting to jail. Like either either the kid get to jail, went to jail, I, he went AWOL and never comes back. Um, got sent to it. Like if if one of the girls gets pregnant, they gotta get sent to a different school. So it's just randomly like you 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 really care for these kids and they just you come to work one day and they're not there you never know what happened to them so it's been an amazing blessing like and of course all the kids didn't make it but the, out of the kids who have made it being able to connect with them on facebook and see like they've gone on to have these lives and families of their own has been an amazing amazing blessing from social media <clears throat> Yo, I'm so glad you shared that though, because with that, there's like a big lesson about patience. And I think education is something that like the world is struggling with how to do it. Right. And so I'm mm -hmm. fascinated by how to educate, but what you said was huge, right? First patience. Yeah. I went to with an understanding, right? You understood why people reacted the way that they did. There was an empathy play there. You had to like consider yeah. all of this stuff. So you had and yeah, something I learned real quick is like, a lot of people, they come into being educators and kind of bring their ego into it. Like, I'm going to assert my will and assert my law. I'm going to make you do what I tell you to do. And you learn real quick, that does not work with these kids. Like, these, these are the kids that will punch the principal in the face <laughs> at a <Right>. moment's notice. <laughs> so you're not just going to assert your will. Like, you, and you learn that if you present to the kid what their choices are. Like you can choose to do this, you can choose to do that. These are the consequences of these choices and make it, put them, put them in a position where they feel like they're choosing to do what you think is the right thing instead of you making them do it. You are much more likely to steer them towards the path that you think they should be on if you, if you approach it that way, instead so, of just, I'm laying down the law. I swear what you just said if we were to like take it from kids and put the word colleagues on other teams, that's a one-on-one -on -one with my boss. That's how powerful the notion of what you're describing really is. It's how I'm being conditioned to play a little bit better ball at work and, and do all the things I'm supposed to be doing in order to help get along with others and 
convince them that maybe there are other ways. But literally, I swear, what you just said is exactly what was has been said to me in meetings on how to deal with people who have contrarian opinions to what I might want them to do. Yeah, and it's, you know, working at, working at a school like this, you're definitely going to learn the hard way because these kids do not care. It was amazing going from elite private school in high school to working at the group home right after. It's like, wow. <laughs> like the... The just the, 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 the lack the of the lack the of dynamics and right the lack of co just knee jerk compliance to authority that the kids had at the group home like I had to admire that in a certain way like these kids are bold <laughs> you walk in the room <laughs> and say good morning and they say shut the fuck up I said like, wow <laughs> it was kind of liberating in a way even as you you know you wanted to guide them towards knowing when to do that or not. <laughs> Still, like there was, uh, there was a power to that that I think you can harness, which which I think I've gotten to see as I've seen what became of them when they became adults and figured out how to put that in the right parts of their lives. That's cool, but it's cool that you were that guy. You're like the dude that they make movies about later on in life. <laughs> I'm not like no, yeah, no, no. that's that. That's a fact. Your life sounds like honestly, your life sounds like a movie. And they, yeah. Let me ask you a question: Did they know? that you did radio yeah that's actually how i got the job i'm glad you mentioned that that's even doper because i was yeah yeah so there was a teacher at the school that listened to wbai and used to record my radio show for his class and they would listen to it in class so my my radio mentor anthony sloan connected with it he was this teacher was also like a carpenter so he used to do like building shit at the radio station sometimes so he connected with Anthony and Anthony was like, listen, I have this young man who's he needs to find a job. And he's like, oh, Jay Smooth. OK, so I came in and uh, interviewed with the teacher and the principal. Um, it was a real I mean, honestly, I shouldn't have got this job because I'm I'm 19 years old. These are high yeah. school kids. And legally, you could yeah, be, a, a you super could be at this group the same home. age as a super senior. It actually didn't make any sense, right? And you could be at this institution until you were 22 legally. Um, so like I'm, the only difference between me and the kids is like I have all the keys. <laughs> and it's a testament to how low the standards are for care for these kids from the hood who could yeah. most benefit. The, the kids who could most benefit from having the most skilled care are the kids who there's the lowest standards for who actually absolutely and works with them. That's, that's something I really got to see in my years working at the group home is like the people who came from some graduate school to learn how to work with kids like this, they're going to be at some other place where you get a bigger check so <laughs> than, just, than this. Just so you know, like, what, so in this case, it was kind of a blessing because I was able to fit in and make it work, but I probably shouldn't have even got that job. On the other hand, you getting that job probably made a huge difference in a lot of people's lives. I mean, yeah, I can say, you know, connecting with the kids is that's it's, there's no better feeling than, uh, you know, reconnecting with a kid and hearing from them. How just they just little things that I wouldn't even have remembered, like really had an impact on them and helped them out. Like I, you, you get to hear a lot of that. That's what that's like the biggest blessing, I think, of teaching in general. My mom also became a teacher and got to experience that same sort of thing of like, man, kids remember when. When you look out for them, when you make them yeah. feel like they deserve a type of respect they haven't got, like that's something that I've learned they they carry with them. Yeah, that's a big fact because you don't you don't. I I remember being being in that environment like like my parents don't listen to me, teachers don't listen, you know, and you just like get this attitude where it's just like yo, just like it genuinely is a parents don't understand like a a yeah. general like a, a like generalization that like adults just don't get it you know so i remember being that age and feeling like that devoutly so it's just like it's really important to me to always be like as welcoming and open you know with kids to like be like yo you can be honest with me like yeah i get it you're just a young young person that's it like you're gonna be an older person later on in life <laughs> You know, it behooves me to like speak to you like the person that you're gonna be mm -hmm. one day, right? Instead of talking right, to you right. like the person right. that you are right now. And 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 you don't get a lot of that. Like this is, 
this is where kids wind up when the system has given up educating them. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's no expectation that this is an institution that gets, they get paid based on how many nights each kid sleeps in the bed and doesn't run away. Like whether they get educated and graduate, that doesn't, doesn't factor in. That doesn't yeah. factor into the budget at all. Right. So it's up, it's up to each individual working there whether they want to give the kid more than just babysitting, making sure you don't fight each other, making sure you don't run away. Right. If y'all if y'all know Max B, he was actually one of my students as a kid at the group home. What? But yeah. That's back when he was, crazy. Back when he was uh, Charlie Wingate. That's crazy. And I didn't know that. The wave I, god. Yeah, I the didn't know for mad god. long. From talking to my other former students on Facebook, one of them hit me to it. He said, yo, you know Max B is Charlie, right? And it was like the end of Sixth Sense. I was like, oh, shit, that is the same person. <laughs> <laughs> yo, that's so crazy. Oh, my God, that's amazing. That and is also, another amazing. one more hip-hop connection. I work with Styles P's mother. <laughs> she was one of the other assistant teachers in the school. Wow, Mrs. that's dope. This is Mrs. Styles. Huh? Word. That's crazy. Yo, it's crazy how many rappers' mothers were teachers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's a that's a that's a that's a like especially back then, like uh probably from the birth all the way through to like, you know, the nineties, you know, uh uh maybe the mid two thousands. I'm pretty sure that there was like a a serious connection you can make there, you know? And 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 I'm sure you know mad mad MCs like just from the New York underground scene alone have become teachers as well. And like Jay Live, uh Breezley Bruin, uh Rabbi Darkside, of course, doing all kind of dope educational stuff. That's crazy. Uh Big Zoo, of course, from EO Dub yeah. Word Zoo. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, yeah. We've, uh we talked to 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 uh, Breeze Bruin and Big Zoo, so both of them are you know interesting this names. record breeze breeze's new record is amazing yeah. by the way no nah, we we spoke we spoke to breeze ever flower not oh. breeze oh, Bre oh. <laughs> oh he's I'm also <laughs> My bad. I got he's a scholar the man is yeah, a no, scholar you... but he's not actually yeah yeah, like, yeah but i'm um... sure that happens all the time <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah my bad nah all good <laughs> all good all good all good it's it easily easily confusing yeah, you know, like you like, know, like if you listen to jazz, there's a Lonnie Liston Smith, and then there's a Doctor Lonnie Smith, and that's like their whole lives. People are going to be mixing them up. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right. So I guess what made you decide to take media more seriously and go down that path? Yeah, you know, it was a gradual process. You know, I think I had I, to. Go I just have to interrupt to say yep. thank you for the subscription, Vincent Price. That's when you get the money on Twitch. Yep. Yes, big up, big up. Thanks, man. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, I think I had to go through a process of kind of maturing and feeling more self-assured and comfortable with myself, and kind of believing I should put myself out that way. I, you know, and that's also like the little speech I made before. It was kind of like I never sold out. I always want to be humble and say like a part of that is I didn't have enough self-esteem to try to sell out until later in life. Like I want to be real about. It. I never want to make it like. I was the one pure righteous person. Like those are limitations I had that in some ways may also work in my favor. Um, but I think coming into my thirties and also sort of building a footprint online, um, you know, I started hiphopmusic.com really early as one of the first hip hop websites and got to be a part of kind of planting a flag for hip hop and building that online hip hop community. Then that became basically the first hip hop blog um, a few years later and kind of building that original hip hop blog community um, to set the stage for a lot of what people knew later on. Like SK from Not Right basically got started from, from reading my blog um, and then everything else evolves from out of there. Now, I mean, it's not only me, but I was part of that original community. Um, so I think doing that more and more over time and uh, getting different experiences, getting older, seeing how I could connect with an audience online bit by bit, I moved towards like, well, maybe I could, uh, maybe I could try to do this thing for a living instead of just compartmentalizing it as a thing I do for the love. And it was when I started making videos, which was around like 2006, um, I had been blogging for a while and uh, like it had gone from, there were like 10 hip hop blogs in the world to there's hundreds and hundreds. And you know, it went, it eventually became like 
you had to do something for shock value to keep your numbers up or you eventually it became like you have to have the mp3s that leaked the fastest which i'm not knocking but it was just like it was different from what i had gotten into it for which was just like writing sharing ideas and having a different type of conversation so i had kind of gotten tired of regular blogging and that was right when video blogging um was starting to become a thing and it's funny because the first time i heard about video blogging my dear friend uh minya o better known as miss info later on who started a blog because of me um she she was writing for i'm just just it's facts it's facts she (laughs) she'll, she'll tell you um she hit me up she was doing something for vibe magazine about video blogging i had never heard of that um and she was like hey dude so she wanted me to i don't know give a comment i forget so i was like what video blogging wait so now instead of just writing something boring you're gonna look boring and sound boring who wants to do that like i was hating hard (laughs) when i first heard heard this idea that was probably like 2005 but by 2006 (laughs) I started like I got I got this editor named Sony Vegas and started playing with it and just real quick I think because Sony Vegas was originally an audio editor that became a video editor it just clicked for me intuitively what I could do with this medium and then it became like a creative challenge like I could have the exchange of ideas that I had on my blog in this other form and if I can figure out the challenge of like how to articulate it, how the visual presentation, how everything can work together to spark that conversation. Like that became a creative challenge that felt like I felt excited again about doing something based on seeing this as a challenge I could try to figure out. Um, And I was one of the first people doing it like from a black space at all, much less a hip hop space. I mean, I would Um, argue if you're doing this in 2006, you're one of the innovators of YouTube. Yeah, uh, yeah, also yeah, I want to yeah, point yeah, out how yeah, cool you are like, because Wallace is in that's Wallace in the back. Right? That's Wallace in the back. Yeah, 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 yeah. When I do my when I do my streams, I have a separate camera for Wallace, but he's he's laying in the cut for this one. Um, <laughs> yeah, nah, but he's over there hamming it up like just that, that right? movement. I mean, I don't know how many people understand the significance of being a person uploading to YouTube or making video content yeah. in that time. But this is something where, like, unlike a lot of people, I really appreciate the significance of how innovative that is, how hard it must have been to embrace that, right? Like, he's... Yeah, it was mad early. Like, back at this time, there was um, there was a dude named Zay Frank who did really dope stuff. There was a show named Rocket Boom that, like, none of these things were big at all compared to what's big now. But those were, like, there was, like, uh, Zay Frank, Rocket Boom, and, like, a few other people <laughs> it wasn't nearly the amount of people doing it now so like we were all kind of figure like the way that someone makes a youtube video now like the whole editing style like this was the first iteration of people figuring out what works and what doesn't work um so it's like it's, it's always it's a lucky thing when you get to get in on the development of a new form early and kind of plant your flag um so i found really quickly that like people connected with what I was saying really well. Like it clicked when I made videos, like it's, it started taking off really quickly. And this also happened to be a time when in the media world, there was like a hot thing people wanted to throw money at. So I was very lucky to like, at a time when I was ready, like we've been discussing at the time I was ready to take it to the next level where I want to earn a living from my craft. I was in a position to do that because there was, there's a company pretty corny tech company but they had money to put into this name pod tech to sign me up uh in 2006 to start making videos for them xxl um under sk from not right and elliot wilson were just starting to want to have a video component right at that time so i made a deal pod tech i don't think they knew i was also making a deal with xxl (laughs) to run the same videos (laughs) i just i just did it i didn't ask permission um so i had deals with pod tech and xxl to make videos for both of them and they both like they were both post each video i put up so that was so it was doubling up your content yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Yo, <laughs> boss. Boss. and i was like i had a relationship with elliot and sk so that was basically just like a handshake deal like they, they mm-hmm. were like, whatever give me to get to hit us with the videos yeah that's fine i mean yeah no that's what's yeah, up yeah, yeah. and um, to be able to have the right to do that 
Right. I mean, I didn't have the right, but they just, I think Podtech <laughs> just catch on. That's the hip, you you do it until you get caught. That's the hip hop creative ethos. Hip hop way, baby. <laughs> the, that's the way that I shot all the videos last right. year. Right. It was like, I was just like, look, listen, like, what are they going to do? Like, right. there's hardly any cops in the streets. Like, I, you know, let's do it. And, and that was like, yeah, so that, that was a pivotal moment for me. It was like a challenge to believe in myself in such a way that I really believed I should put myself out there. Like just had, just as a radio person, just believing I should have my face on camera and be comfortable with that was like an adjustment of my sense of self. And also believing like, I should try and earn a living from my representation of the culture and what I do in media. Like this was where it clicked right at the right time to kind of step it up to that level. And I've been blessed to basically do that ever since. And that was what year you said? That's. I feel like 2006. 2006. It's always hard to place exactly. I think it's so we so and we met like around 2000 and like I think. Um, yeah, right. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I kind of I kind of came back into the battle rap scene from the WRCs because my good friend Mozzie, another another uh, representative of the culture for many years, was hosting the WRCs. That was like 2007, I think. You a double alumni? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, right. And I connected with y'all through that. Yeah, so I, yeah, I was one of the judges for uh, He's one of the judges. The, in, the infamous stolen tapes battles for the WRCs. <laughs> I witnessed the whole thing go down. And yeah, then I've been very lucky to try and, you know, support as best I can. That was, by the way, that was a huge controversy. Those missing tapes Yo. was like a huge controversy in battle rap at the time. Yeah. Like, that's big because like King of the Dot comes directly out of that. Grind time comes out of that. Like everyone who started these other leagues was in that room and was so fucked up by how things went wrong. They were like, I'm gonna start my own league. And that's like the neck the modern form of hip hop battle leagues. You can trace a lot of it directly from WRCs having such a big thing and then fucking it all up in that one day. Wait, what what yeah. happened? I don't know a damn thing about what you're talking about. <laughs> it's a, I shouldn't have brought it up because this is like we got to explain a whole season of a soap opera now. <laughs> but so this was so the WRCs was this really dope tournament. It was like a two on two tournament um, where people from different parts of the world would all compete in these like two on two battles. And it was like right at the cusp of things moving from supposedly freestyle to written. So it was a mix of like some people were going all off the top. Some people were doing mostly writtens, but kind of fitting it in with some off the top. Um, so there was a whole, like, it was really amazing two-on-two -two freestyle rap competition that became, like, a, at least a big cult thing, a big underground thing online. And for their second season, like, the second year of the W the World Rap Championships, it was, was it was it 50000 I feel like it was $50,000. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, it was. It was, it was, it was like, a, it, was a, it was a massive. A amount at the time. Right. This is way before like Smack URL were working with the budgets they were working now or RBE or what have you. Um, so this was crazy amount of money. So, and it's all the best battlers. Like this is, you know, the two Titans were like uh, Thesaurus and Immaculate and uh, uh, Marv One and uh, yeah, what's his partner's name? That's for Cody. Quest McCody, thank you. Apologies, Quest. I'm just nah, I'm at that no age where I don't remember names. There's no disrespect to Quest. Um, yeah, so this is like, those are the two squads that you couldn't imagine ever any either of them ever losing. So having to be one of the judges for them battling each other was like the most stressful thing in the world. And what happened was the people who ran the league, it was, it was these British dudes. Um, it was Jump Off TV. It was like this British organization, this dude, Harry. They... This was all new. We didn't know how to. Do, so he had. He wanted to make sure it was done right, but he like overcompensated by making this scoring system that was mad complex. It was like filling out a whole Excel sheet. Like, so we were sitting there, fill, like, I couldn't tell who I had winning based on filling out this sheet. And the judges were a mix of like people like me who had been watching WRCs and people who are respected in hip hop, but weren't really watching the battle. So they don't understand all the inside jokes in the context. So like they would think one team was winning, but fans that have been watching everything were like, what? No, the other squad was, how could you vote for them? So that's, that's basically what happened is there was a decision 
that the owners of the league thought, well, when the, when the fans see that you voted this way, they're going to be pissed. So I'm going to step in. They tried to intervene and like, no, let's do it over again. But they didn't realize once you do that, everyone's trust in the whole enterprise is fucked up. <laughs> yeah. So it just it became a situation where they stepped in and like overruled the judges and made it. I forget all the details, but then people were like, well, wait, so how do we trust the judging if you're just going to step in for what you think was the real winner? And then after that, um, so that so the, the event just like stopped for like an hour and everyone's like negotiating and cursing. Then we finally start up again and it gets to the finals or maybe it's the semifinals. It's the two teams I talked about, Quest McCody and Marv one versus the Soros and Immaculate and impossible to judge. Like this is why I don't judge battles anymore because it's so subjective when both sides are amazing. So I don't know. Everybody wins. How am I supposed to pick? <laughs> so, so it came out with uh, Thesaurus and Immaculate were voted the winners and Quest and Marv because nobody had trust in the judging anymore. They were like, well, fuck that. I would show me all the scorecards. I don't agree. So then the, the whole event stopped again and everyone's negotiating how we're even going to start up again because nobody trusts the process anymore. And while all this is going on, and we're like, they rented out a whole studio space. So we were away from the main performance room. At some point while all this negotiation is going on, somebody steals all the videotapes of the battles. <laughs> <laughs> so battle rap, yo. It's <laughs> Apologies so for such rap. a long story. But so then that no, stops you don't the have event. to apologize for that. That's what we do here. That stops the event for like two more hours. And just people are, how do we find? So they're, okay, we're going to search everybody. Okay, no, we're not. <laughs> Nobody's going to. It's just <laughs> finally, after like a couple of hours, they, they do the final finals, which I, I'm trying to. It was, it was the source and Ilmac against like maybe Frankie Waps and Jay's Juice was the finals, I think. But by then, like, nobody's heart is in it because the whole day has just been completely fucked and everyone it went from like the most amazing day with like all the best battlers in the world and this one big room to like oh my god how did this completely turn the shit so that basically killed the wrc's as a league and like organic who runs king of the dot league now he was one of the competitors in the wrc's um direct who started grind time was, he, grind time was one all of, the of these all of these next generations of leagues came from the battlers themselves learning from what went wrong with the WRCs and like building their own shit. Yeah. That's Fact. huge though. Battle rap history. But it's even like more than that. It's just like, there's this weird idea out there that all press is good press. And I would argue that this is a great example of when yeah, one not, bad not press all. article destroys your entire enterprise. And I want to say, cause the, for the 10 people who care about this, like I think, yeah, jump off yeah. and, and w J jump off and wrc's kind of get looked back on like some fuck ups but having been there in the room like they fucked it up but they had only good intent like it didn't come from any corruption on their part they weren't trying to jerk anybody it was just a new thing that no, they yeah, had but it's more like i i don't want to like play it like that too because it's like yo i've you, you end up in situations when you have to make decisions, when you have to really consider things and you overthink is often what happens. You overthink and exactly then you can't right. go back. So it's exactly. not to me like negative. It's like a learning lesson, a big old knowledge nugget that we can all take from that. Like, even if you're wrong, it's like better to be wrong, but be wrong. Like honestly, than to try to duplicitously be right is be like the, 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 the example, because trust is so important. Right. Do you, we did yeah, get a no, I said also I said shout out uh Ur from Don't Flop. That also Ur was Ur, one of the competitors. Don't flop. Yes. As Ur, well. Like he was one of the people who the was three right. main leagues. He was main... in the battle that got overturned and was mad disgruntled. And that's from from there he started the Don't Flop League in the UK. In the UK. Those three leagues were essentially the next evolution of battle rap. And then what we established in there essentially became the threshold and foundation that battle rap to this day uh, builds off of and goes off of that. Uh, yeah. No, that's a like really good stuff. Cause I mean, there's definitely more than 10 people who care. Most of us just don't know. And it's, hard uh, to yeah, know. Uh, and uh, battle raps like 
there's like a battle rap league in Montreal, right? Like, there's like stuff all over. Like, it's not exactly. It's, yeah, it's battle rap leagues everywhere. Yeah. So like, I feel comfortable going around the world and like being able to bump into people who like actually watch battle rap, American yeah. battle rap. That's amazing. Know? You, if you search around on YouTube, there's all these leagues in other countries that bang millions of views. Out. Millions of views. Yeah, Philippines, but, um, Russia, everywhere. They just get millions of views. I definitely think, though, it's hard to to get into battle rap because you just have questions that don't have answers. As an yeah. example, we got one. It's harder than ever now. We got one from Ismail, uh, who's watching all of this stuff, and like it's like education, man. Like I didn't actually ever personally watch battle rap ever. I watched Bodied. It kind of taught me a couple things. <laughs> no, for real written, though. Uh, written like, by I will my never... man. Of the dot. I'll just I won't forget Oops. that like X O's X Ho and they had the things pop up on the line. I'm like, oh, that's yeah. what the fuck's happening here. You know, if, and like it didn't click until I saw that. Anyway, but like then I started talking to people through uh through uh basically Flacco over there, and he started bringing me battle rappers, and I'm like, oh shit, I gotta learn about battle rap. But, yo, there's no you can't Google this shit. Like people and the interviewers yeah, are yeah. such, and I blame the media. The media did like nothing to like help battle rap in like certain eras when I'm trying to like Google these people and seeing how they get like, I don't know, ambushed by journalists all over. It's a weird thing to watch happen. But we did get the question. He found some bad Vlad interviews. More than that. <laughs> it's not just Vlad. It's a lot of people. These guys come No, it is. Them. It is. It, it was definitely, look. Uh, part modern of, part guys of too. What, part of what endeared me to working with you, Holden, was that it was like, to me, Jay, I'm like, yo, this is like, like, we want to get our stories out there too, man. It's like, we want to sit there and, and like share and impart what we've learned, you know? And there's so much knowledge um, in the mm. indie, uh, in the indie underground hip hop scene and the battle, which you know uh, had a lot of leak over into battle rap, you know, like, the and best... like people aren't talking to us, and it's like you're missing out. But like I, I, I watch these these journalists, and I'm talking like 2020 people. We're not even going like all the way back, and still you listen to these questions, and it's like these guys clearly want to be. Mr. I'm fucking cool too, more often than not. And that has this weird effect on interview. Look, I'm not as cool as Jay Smooth. It's fucking facts. I know that. It's not, It's easy for me to say that I'm not that cool. I aspire to be that cool. I hope to be like you when I'm your age and shit and get there. Like, it's role model shit. I, I give you that respect. It's what it is. Most often, that's how I feel. Like, yo, you're just all cool people I can learn from. So I, I take that approach. But part of it was like, because I didn't watch all these in, underground interviews, like the low end until I really like started looking at battle rappers. And yo, I found like, unless it was a battle rapper of some kind doing the interview, I found zero that I would really enjoy watching because they don't talk about anything. It's like, yo, remember that time this thing? I'm like, nobody fucking knows about that time except for you that's and your guy at the street. And the it's culture. like- So that's the, like battle rap is, I mean, it's evolved just the whole format of it has moved far away from any musicality, which I'm not saying is a bad thing, but it makes it harder for a newcomer. Like, it's acapella, and there's no, like, mm. you're not trying to rhyme Ooh, as if you're on a beat. It's just like so that's perform a, poetry. That's like so if you never watched a battle before. You're like, what? what is even happening now? And then there's a lot of content that you might rightfully be offended by, like I said. And everything is so self-referential. Like if you didn't watch each person's last 20 battles and everyone else is in the room's last 10 battles, you, it, there's this reference, 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 like triple entendre where you don't get any of the entendres if you're not in the battle scene right. already. So it's, so, very, it's definitely hard for newcomers. So that actually was a great segue back to Ishmael's question, which is why did battle rap stop using beats? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good, I, I mean, I'm, Dutch can probably answer that as well as me. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think that's just, that's an evolution that happened over time. Um, you know, I mean, there was always more than one evolution going on because there's like the scribble jam scene where people were still rhyming over beats for a long time. The blaze battles were over a beat, right? Um, yeah, blaze battles were over a beat. Yeah. But from a but then the whole like smack DVD tradition is you're out in the park with no yeah the, that's what I was gonna say was that like when you're outside in the streets like and right. that's where 
that's where like where it really really cultivated hardcore was the streets of new york mm. city and like people right. going to different neighborhoods and it becoming like a thing like yo this rapper reps that neighborhood and that that rapper and it's and it's just like a real it was bef- like a un un uh, unofficial league you know in the city within itself and then and that's right yeah that that kind of like became the norm like and it's where just, it's just like, like the, the fundamental the fundamental form like the basic mm-hmm. form that is going to manifest in is a cipher out on the street mm. or you know in your room where wherever you're at like that's even the like, cipher is the most natural environment the easiest environment for battling but there's a lot ball. of a lot of the people i've talked to and it's something that even happened in montreal of like a certain generation let's say a lot of the guys who would be bigger names in battle rap now not like the newer ones they literally ran streets battling each other they would go like and that happened in montreal that happened in a few places that i've talked to people like it was just the thing that you did you would just run the streets and go to neighborhoods and just be like yo let's fucking go and just spit your bars right and you can just you without a beat you can perform it a different way without that limitation of having to be on the beat um limitation interesting it, over time you know, it's like i was saying it's there's a gift of the rhythmic interplay between your bars and the beat yeah. missing when you're acapella but when you're acapella there's so much more flexibility to have a so much pause more. stretch out one line way longer than the other way longer punch you can you can different. add so much effect and right. you're, you're just like so, your energy that you give to that's Right, Part like of you watch kind of someone like New control. Jersey twerk, like the yeah, whole New sense of dynamics twerk. where he gets mad quiet and slow, then he's mad loud. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. So the, there's so much of the, the level, the complexity of performance that you have from today's MCs could only evolve if you're in an acapella format where you could just stretch things out and perform and act out without the limitations of having to interact with the beat. So it's super nifty as as you're describing that. It makes me think of that uh, Amazon Prime show, The Marvelous Mrs. Mabel, where like she goes through the process of learning about comedy, and it's all of what you're describing. Honestly, that's what like slaps with comedy, and it's interesting. And and that's not like, and I'm never saying that one thing is just objectively better than the other. No, it's it's more rhyming over a beat is dope in a way that acapella rhymes are not. But there's this there's mm-hmm. strength is figuring out what the strength is of each one. And for battling, I think people are leaned into the benefits of doing it a cappella. But it's mm-hmm. it's just that it's it's cause it's like um it almost requires like that same timing and delivery of a of a comic, a successful comic to be exactly. a good battle rapper. Where right. I make a shit battler because I'm all about that song shit. I know all about the melodramatic play to the music shit, which is just completely different skill set to me which is always why i've had a lot of trouble with battle rap because i'm also not the biggest i don't watch a lot of comics to be honest with you i'd rather right. watch a guy like you no, know, not to like guys you up but i like watching people like you make video essays and shit that's my my jazz you know like so it's a different like sphere but like i noticed a lot of people who are really into comedy also seem to really fuck with battle rap like that because of the same level of word play and timing and and shit like that which is super nifty. out control it's, it's right. it also goes back to, to to the ability to know how to engage with a crowd in the right way wait for exactly the right spot to you know do a certain thing and play to the people and it's just it's all it's all tied in together in the same way I also compare um battle rap uh to like uh, uh combat sports like boxing mm. and like MMA because um, it's just it's one on one so it's just like there's nobody nobody there to save you like nobody's gonna save you when you get punched in the face with like mm. a bar that's really disrespectful that actually hits you like right in the gut and mm. like no there nobody nobody's gonna take that punch for you you're there you're the one taking the punch on camera it's not an actual physical punch but like it's a, a verbal one and and you're the one that's like the so punching like, bag, you know? So. so you can look at it like um, battle rap is more like to MMA, whereas the songwriting element's more like the wrestling world, as we've made those comparisons with the characters adopted through the songs and stuff. I mean, oh. There's a lot of wrestling in battle rap. 
<laughs> yeah, no. Nah, well, I was going to say there's, definitely there's a lot of, a lot of, okay. there's a lot of wrestling in Battle Rap. Too. There's a whole bunch okay, of fair enough. Oh, there's characters. There's characters. Yeah, I mean, that's how you. That's that, how you build interest in the battle is you build a storyline that y'all are, yeah, yeah, have issues okay. with each other that you might not really have half the time. Yeah, they, they, and they, they all love wrestling culture because of yeah, that. Because yeah, yeah. they look at themselves kind of like wrestlers where they're creating personas okay, for okay, themselves. Okay. I know guys, I know guys that like their persona on camera is like the, the ah, and loud. And they, 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 they set, they seem like the most vicious people. And then you get them off camera and they're the most soft spoken kind-hearted people they're really not that type of guy it's just a persona for the cameras and for like uh battle mm. rap scene you know and that's, that's cool it. though i think these this yeah. is believe it or not i think this kind of chat is really important because it helps people who do not understand the culture understand what is happening there because everybody watched wwe at some point or another not everybody but you know a lot a lot a lot of people you know so it's cool that you're able to like put it like that because it actually makes a lot of sense to me. The second you said kayfabe, I'm like, oh shit, okay, yeah, okay, okay, and then I realized it's just faces and heels playing a crowd. Right. And right. That, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And that and that's what that's one of the things I've always loved is how much. Um, and that's what sucks about the pandemic era, even though people have still been doing dope work in the battle scene. Like that's such a big part of the ex battle experience is just that collective ecstatic release of energy mm -hmm. when a haymaker mm -hmm. lands like you know, oh my god there's <laughs> when no when like, says a, get smacked the fuck out of here and the whole on stage and the crowd is like ah oh! <laughs> yo it's the most that's, amazing. like that's why that's why that super hot fire video hit cuz it captures yeah, it, exactly it. that oh like how how much that release of energy that exchange of energy with the crowd is such a big part of the magic super mm. yeah no that's 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 probably like one of the like greatest highs i've ever had yeah um in in rapping and i've i've gotten to experience the like the blessings of performing for a big crowd and having them be into you i haven't experienced like the blessing of like hearing my song on like hot 97 right which is like a super aspire to think as a uh, New Yorker growing up, you know, in mm -hmm. this, right? But, like, uh, I got to experience a lot of great highs, and, like, there's no high, like, get, having a crowd, like, really, like, on the edge of their seat for everything you're saying, and then when you land the punchline, they just with you so hard, and their reaction is just, like, so much energy that it's just, yeah, it's very, it's very, it's an incredible high, literally. Yeah, that's dope. I uh, no, I mean that sincerely. Um, I don't have a lot to contribute to that part, but it's still dope. Still, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's helpful. Like context is basically, you know, what's up, Merker? Merker, shut up. So I just Merker want to say what's up. You will mess up. That's my favorite. So that very mess up fair. You know, Jay Smooth is also a mess up member. You know, are you? Like, oh, you know yeah, yeah. He I participates know, yeah. with us every once in a blue here and there, here and there. Fair yeah, enough. here and there. I gotta be him and Penn, out him and Penn, him and Penn, him and Penn do things sparingly, but it's like it makes it that much more of a blessing. Mm. Yeah, shout out to Penn. Like, yeah, that's cool. Yo, I connected Penn with the Jimmy Fallon show, and they had that whole battle rap uh, segment on Jimmy Fallon. Word, you! I did not know that you yeah. were the, the connecting factor with that. That's amazing. That is simply amazing. Like, that know, then, then that then bore fruition. So like Dama got the opportunity that she got to be on there thanks to Jay Smooth connecting um Penn to the Jimmy Fallon show and then Penn brought on like a litany of like talented people from New York City's like underground scene. And mm. Dama was one of them and she talked about that. Like that's crazy. Honestly, Amazing. It is incredible. Bridging the gap again. You got you 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 behind the scenes guys who do that kind of stuff. And just because, yeah, that's a behind the scenes move if I ever heard one. Those, you're like the most valuable people in the world. Like, that's power. People don't know what power is. That's power. Power is the power to elevate somebody. It's, yeah. And I, let me say for people watching at home, don't do free consulting. <laughs> don't do what I did because they reached out to me and I just connected them with Penn on the strength. That's, <laughs> you should say, here's my rate and then do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's, but it's definitely a blessing to, uh, 
to be able to like to be in a position to have a door open up and you can make sure someone real gets in that door who's going to represent correctly and and make the most of that for themselves and the community we all rep. And Penn, yeah, Penn really came in there and collabed with them on something cool and a bunch of dope voices got to be on there. I know I had the the pleasure of talking to Penn. So, uh, damn, that's like you helped me get that great conversation too in some big abstract way of how the universe connects stuff. Yeah, no, that's a that's a super like uh, crazy like oh like we were we're like the conversation's actually like one degree from like another like other multiple other guests we've already had on the show. You yeah. know, yeah. like we had yeah. Penn and we. Yeah. yeah, and I should say to give everyone context, all these people from the battle scene, most of them I knew before. Like I knew Sarah Connor when her name was Lyric and she was yes. just an MC. I knew Poison Pen like way before battle scene when he was just MC and mm. P, yep. P, P H rest in peace. A, a lot of these had like the a direct line from just underground hip hop scene in general in New York to the New York battle scene. So how did you get a TED talk? <laughs> that that's a good question. Um, you know, I as I started doing uh, video blogging over time, you know, I started out mostly just like commenting on hip hop and other cultural stuff. But as I would comment on race issues and politics once in a while, it would really strike a chord. And I saw that there was there was a big audience out there for someone trying to communicate about those issues um, in a way that was clear um, and fresh. So I kind of, over the years, I kind of became just like a, a political racial justice uh, vlogger more than I was a hip hop vlogger. Um, and one of the outgrowths of that was people asking me if I wanted to speak at a college or a university. And I would always say no, because I felt like I had no idea how, I'm making five minute YouTube videos, stand on a stage and talk for 45 minutes. Like I have no idea how to do that. So I'd always say no until 2011, um, these uh, kids from Hampshire College reached out to me like, hey, so we're organizing the TEDx talk here at Hampshire. We'd love to have you come in and talk about, uh, you know, build on what you talked about in your How to Tell Someone to Sound Racist video. And, you know, TED Talk, I think TED Talks are kind of looked at as kind of corny now, but it, it was still new then and kind of like... I looked at it corny at all, man. They're like legit. Yeah, like, no. Like, we're Yo, like saying, if anybody like, says TED Talk, corny, I'm like... <sighs> No, nah, I don't I, know. Who caused them? I don't know a single person. Kanye's corny. I mean, Kanye's like, whack. I'm like, word, word. I, I, I Yo, would, you, you yeah. have an opinion, and you, sir, are you utilizing it to express to me that I should probably not listen to your opinion on music. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and it's just one of those things where, like, yeah, TED Talks are like, I, big, I find big them love. incredibly educational. Like, like you yeah. learn a lot. From things yeah, like well, back, yeah, and back, yeah. So back at that time, if like this was, this is a good look for me for me to do that. Um, and it's a very like when you do a TED talk, they have very strict regulations for the production values. So you're gonna have like well produced, like the show is gonna be tight. So it was. Uh, so I felt like that was a good, and also TED talks are shorter. Like if you get booked to speak at a university, I learned later on after this. They want you to talk for 40 minutes generally. A TED talk is 18 minutes maximum. So that having never done it before, that was um that seemed more manageable to me. So I was like, you know what? Fuck it. Let me let me try this out. So I agreed to do it. It was mad intimidating. <laughs> this was while Occupy Wall Street was going on. And like the weekend before, I was like, shit, maybe I should just go down to Zuccotti Park and get arrested. And then I won't have to do this talk. And I was scared to death. <laughs> Um, and I was writing it. I didn't do it because, like, it was a Friday, and you know, if you go to Central Book and you on Friday, yeah. you're in until Mondays. Uh, I don't. <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, you'd, been, you'd have been in the bullpens too. So right. that, <laughs> the bullpens right. are, are are the Manhattan Central Booking uh, or uh, 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 the Manhattan jails that they'll take you to if you break a. Uh, uh, a law and you need to be arrested um, yeah. and nah. they usually let you out if you don't have like a, a record or any bench warrants they'll just bring you there process you put you in the system give you a desk ticket desk appearance ticket and then you come back but if you're like me who's like every time they let you out you're like catch me if you can I'm gingerbread man <laughs> and you got like a, 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 a like a, 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 a warrant
warrant, a bench warrant sitting there. And they're like, no, you got to stay here for 24 hours. Like, no, that's it. We're not going to let you go with a desk appearance ticket. Right. <laughs> and, and each borough in New York City has a different jail like that. And they all kind of have like their own slang names. And, and the one in Manhattan is the Bullpins. Mm. Right. Whoops, I just muted Jay Smooth by mistake because I hit the wrong button trying to replace the pen. <laughs> okay, check, check. I'm back now. Yeah, we're good. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. So that yes, and I mean I'm I'm a square. I'm a civilian. It's not. I only knew this secondhand, but I knew enough to know. Let me not get arrested on this Friday night. Um, so I was like, okay, I guess I got to go and do this talk. So I was writing the speech dead up until I went on stage. Uh, like some of the lines that people quote the most, I wrote that like. I wrote it down while other people were giving their speeches that night before I went on. Um, so it was mad intimidating, but it came off well. Like it connected, people really clicked with it. And it was like we were saying about the whole battle event experience, like coming from being at home, constructing a video and having people connect with it that way. That's amazing in one form, but that in-person exchange of energy, like given your perspective and have people react to it, like just having, being on stage and having people laugh at your jokes is fucking amazing. Mm. <laughs> and I never knew that. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this is great. <laughs> people get what I'm saying. And just having people like absorb my perspective and connect with it and have that exchange of energy and getting to talk to people afterwards about it. That was my first experience of that that went well. And then the TED Talk got a lot of views when it went up. So that I was very lucky to have that lead into me getting to do a lot of talks at colleges and universities and stuff like that afterwards, which is a great it's a much easier way to get paid than being on YouTube, first of all, because universities be having endowments and can hand out checks. Mm. Um, and one thing I'd if you're ever in that position, get an agent who's going to negotiate the price for you. Because when I was doing it, the idea that people are paying me to come and talk was so wild to me. I was asking for way less than what a professional agent is going to ask for from a university. So get, no get someone to represent you if you're lucky enough to be in that position. That guy, it's like a life goal to be a guy that gets to go give talks. So hearing you say that is going to probably help me get more money in the future. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, these schools be having money. Like, don't, I felt like, I, I felt guilty the amount that the agency was asking. I was like, wow, am I supposed to ask for this? But colleges make a lot of money, y'all. <laughs> yeah, when you said endowments, it's like you don't know what they make on an endowment a year most of the times, you know? Right. Yeah. And someone like me, like I'm, I've done so much free media over the years. And like the videos that I do on these topics, teachers are using them in classrooms for free. I'm not getting paid for that. So, but even, even like, like bigger than that, aware like, of, mm -hmm. I am so terrible at the idea of asking for money in a sincere way for my content. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of tricks that would get, I, I call them tricks because to me, they always feel manipulative and shit that would in, it get like a lot more money, but like that kind of leads to a point where you, you end up at fiscally undervaluing yourself when opportunities right. do arrive. And yo, I know for a fact I've done some freelance where I like as a writer, just way underpaid just cause I didn't even realize you could ask for bigger numbers and yeah, that people yeah. pay them. And I'm like, wait, that's why it's really important for people to share with each other how much they're getting paid. Like capitalism has us trained to think that we're not supposed to tell each other what our salaries are, what kind of check we're getting. That empowers the people who want to give us as little money as possible. The more we communicate to each other how much we are each getting for the same work, the more power we have to negotiate and get what we should be getting. That's a huge one. That's why Glassdoor is kind of dope. I'm not going to lie. That site is very helpful. I don't know if that's in the States, but it's in Canada and it tells you in your area approximately what each salary is worth. And it's a really powerful negotiating tool because the second you say Glassdoor, CEOs take it seriously because what can they do? It's real shit. You know, oh, there's a range of my position and I'm on the low end of that range. That's an interesting thing to know. But, um, my uh, Ismail pointed out something before that blew my mind because I watched a shit ton of their content. But you did a crash course series. How yes. Did you pull off yeah, crash yeah. course like fuck that. For me, that's like as cool as when Flacco gets all excited about a battle rap thing. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things that I've done. And you know, the Green Brothers—they're also very early video bloggers as well. We started around the same time. Um, wow. So we, we were both appreciators of each other's work. And we, I had talked to Hank like many times before we finally connected. And so on Crash Course, they were going to do a media literacy series 
Um, and that was, I think he had had me in mind, like, I want to bring Jay in. And that was the one where he said, okay, I think Jay could do this media literacy thing well. So I definitely said, like, I was excited to work with them. Um, you know, that's another, like, doing the freelance independent media thing. It's not that often you get to work with a, a well-oiled machine. Like you're gonna be, you're gonna be working for real dysfunctional, sloppy outlets that have a check to give you a lot of the time. But when you work with people who know exactly how to put something together, make it tight, and they have a built-in audience that's gonna connect with it, like that's that's a special thing. So working with Crash Course was really dope. I flew out to Mon, they flew me out to Montana where their studio is, and I spent a week there recording the whole thing. And like, they put it together super tight. They put, I can tell you from behind the scenes, they put a lot of research into each series that they do. Like they consult with mad experts on whatever the topic is. And we, and then when I get there, I go over it with them and tell them any changes I want. Um, and yeah, I think that came out real dope. And like people who work in that field have been like, okay, the, you, you represented the media literacy, media literacy thing pretty well. And is a very timely topic for sure. So uh, yeah, I was very psyched to get that one done. Man, it's just like you've done a lot of things I would personally love to do. So I think it's just all these cool accomplishments. Like who doesn't want to do a TED talk? Like I think everybody wants to do a TED talk. That's my thought. I yeah. mean, I'll, I'll tell you the secret, connect with, there's the TED, there's like the TED conference where they do the TED talk. And then there's TEDx talks that happen locally right. at different schools. And so if you connect with someone who's doing a TEDx talk, they still maintain the same production values. Like they're super tight about how you produce a TEDx talk. Like they had a rule. You, I forget there was a certain, there's only a certain number of people you could have in the audience. And it was like 90 people. Um, so, and they Hampshire was trying to have a hundred people and Ted was like, no, 90 people. <laughs> so like everything has to be produced exactly to their standards. So you can That's do, dope. you can do any local TEDx thing and the quality is going to be on a certain level. Now, is not automatically going to get views. The TED conference made TED talks, they all get views. You do a TEDx talk, you got to be ready to hustle for that one to get views. Yeah, but that's the same thing with a lot of media, right? I'm learning yeah. about the other side of that, being the media guy and learning about what it is when a guy puts your uh, video on their website versus when a guy does not do that. And the the fact is, I, I have videos on my Clips channel sitting at like three views still. And it's like, yeah... I don't think my audience knows who you are and the internet doesn't yeah, know who you it's are. It's so different. The, the <laughs> type of hustle, like in old school media, all of the hustle was before you got it published. Mm -hmm. I was talking to my friend Trevor that I used to do the radio show with. He does, you know, he was doing a lot of writing for the Huffington Post and he used to, you know, like me, he used to write in hip hop outlets. He was like, you know, back in the days, I'd like, like I get the piece done. The magazine agrees to publish it. I give it to them and then my work is done. It's going to be in the magazine. Now I get it published and that's where the work starts. Like I, I have to spend the next two weeks doing everything I can for this to get views or nobody's going to look at it. Like it's a whole, where, where the whole bulk of the hustle is, is all at the other end of the process now. But it's fascinating because I think a lot of people in the artist world are still adapting to this reality a lot, a lot, right? Like they're, they're not aware of like how to promote this stuff and actually, how, okay. So given that you do all this stuff, what would be like your best tips to, to like break through the noise if you're somebody with content? Cause you've clearly done it ethically. I'm going to assume that you're, you're an ethical dude. So, uh, I, I'm assuming I could be wrong. So I would I mean, be, I don't know what type of ethics you're talking about, but hopefully like more, I don't know, like that conventional sense <laughs> of like, given everything you've ever fucking said right. in your videos, I would assume you don't try to be malicious with your tactics. No. Yeah, no. And that's definitely something I, and that's not something you have to do. Like you get the most clicks from dunking on somebody and you don't have to care whether your dunk is entirely fair or not. Like mm. you're not going to get more clicks for adding some fairness to your dunk you're going to get mm -hmm. clicks from how vicious and entertaining the dunk is. So it's, it's totally optional whether you want to be fair to the person you're criticizing as someone who usually when I'm usually when I make a video, somebody fucks something up and I'm criticizing them. Right. And it's always been important to me to be as real and as blunt as I can while not taking cheap shots, trying to understand things from their point of view and be fair to them without like without being soft on them like i'm gonna be as real as i need to be but be as kind as i can be along with that so that, that's something i believe in doing you don't have to do for sure 
Yeah, but like your content aged perfectly, like a, like a cheese or something. So like I know it's a weird example, but <laughs> cheese like gets better over there. anyway. It's just facts. Uh, but wine, like, wine, yeah, that's good. But anyway, they both age well. It's just facts of the situation. Like a ten-year cheddar is some shit that's like fucking Mark champagne. Then true, true, true. Um, true, though. true, true with cheese. True, true. I'm just, yeah. Anyway. Uh, it's like sometimes you pick the weird hills, okay? You just pick them for weird reasons, and you just add it in the long chats. Um, but um, I think that your content like works. Like, how many people shit do you go back and watch like ten years ago, and it's just whack? Cause yo, all of our cultural sensitivities do evolve, right? So like. Even the most like profoundly ignorant person is probably a little more sensitive than they were ten years ago, just on some they had yeah. to be shit. So when we go back and we like watch that old stuff, you know, like sometimes it feels weird. But when I watched uh, a lot of your old ones too, because I got fascinated by how it felt like you had written it today. A lot of your content was so maybe people should listen to what you're doing more than what other people are doing because yo you're doing it 30 plus years right 30 30 plus to me been, longe- doing, been, been doing something on a microphone for 30 years like longevity is like the rarest shit in this game like lo- real longevity like you know three decades is legend status there's no ifs ands or buts about it how you're in your fourth decade of doing this shit like i mean as a as a person, I would argue you're doing things way better than other people. Money is one thing, but a lot of people get money and then aren't doing it later. So clearly, money doesn't create longevity, and longevity is so much more fascinating to me than uh, money and fame. Yeah, I mean that's that's what I try to tell myself. <laughs> so it's good to hear. <laughs> I, that's it's just cool. So I mean, outside of that, right? So you have your wait. Wait, was there a question I was supposed to be answering? How to market it how to break through oh yeah yeah yeah. how to break through right thank you um i mean i think you got to be passionate about what you're doing um so that you'll be able to stay in it for the long hard road both of getting better at it and of building an audience for it like you got to you got to love it enough that you're going to keep doing it while there's 10 viewers on the twitch for like you know there's mad people who are big twitch streamers now that like they had 10, 20, 30 viewers for like a year or two years. Like you got to keep, yeah, you got to keep doing nine. things that have faith that it's going to click eventually and love it enough that you'd be doing it even if it never blows up like that. And then from that passion, you have to have consistency. Now more than ever doing media online, like there's some people who could like, they can make a magnum opus once every few months and come back out and it clicks. But for most of us, you need to be consistent so that people know they can keep coming back for more of your work and build a relationship over time and keep at it and build up that momentum. Like when you, if you're doing something every Friday for six weeks and then you don't show up for a month, like you're going to be starting from scratch, building up that audience again. You got to keep, come back. You got to keep at Big facts. Uh, I've learned, I learned that lesson a long time ago. And that's hard for me. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm still like an introvert, putting myself on the stage figurative figuratively speaking and performing like I have a limited store of energy of that and I sometimes I gotta be to myself and regroup and be ready to do it again so it could be hard for me to like when I have a contract where I'm supposed to do two videos a week that's like almost impossible for me to do like I can have Mm. spurts where like I want to rock out and be on the camera and I might want to take a couple of months off but it's very hard in this media landscape not allowed, unless you know. unless you've put in a long time building up relationships yeah. with people who want to connect with your work like you got it you kind of got to stay in the mix that's huge can i ask you a completely unrelated question that organically popped up in the comments <clears throat> do you use a bunch of cream to keep your skin so good <laughs> yeah i just don't have a very uh good camera that's the main thing <laughs> 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 otherwise i can't really you know i've never i've never smoked and i don't drink a lot um that's about all i can tell you other than that probably just luck mm, we got that'll, uh, run, that'll run out at some point i'm gonna go with the yeah i can testify Jay, jay's but look the same for like i mean at least the last 
12 or something years that I've known him, you know, 13 you years that yeah. I've known him. I have, a, I have yeah. a lucky streak that's continuing, but you know, we, I think we all got to be ready to embrace getting older because, uh, yeah, 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 big facts, absolutely. I personally love absolutely. the process a little it's bit better. It's as my, my man Swave Seven said, you know, what's worse than getting old, not getting old. Mm. Facts, but uh, facts. we got a good follow up comment from Merker that I thought was just humorous. He uses dreams and passions instead of creams. That's the real secret <laughs> to the fountain of youth. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Not a wrinkle in sight. These are real comments. You'll see them in the playback when you watch it. They're popping up on screen. <laughs> I'm going to definitely go back and watch. So, like, yeah. BLM. You're basically, you do. You have the Pharrell effect. Because I swear, I've now looked at you in the pictures. You, you're, you're like Pharrell. You just, you're ageless. So, so, far, so far, it's going to, I feel like, I feel like it's I'm going to fall off a cliff at some point <laughs> and that's going to change real quick, but we'll see. I, I mean, it's got to be, even if that happens, that's a fucking great run. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are you up to these days? It was a little hard to determine because you have a Patreon and I found that. And then like, it seems, seems like there's like this hard stop on your content that's available on the internet. Like your YouTube stops in like 2017 or 18 or something. And then at some point your Facebook videos stop. And then, uh, what, what happened at this point to create this transition and this life? Cause it seems like it was some pivot or something was going on. Yeah. I mean, a big thing that happened was, uh, my partner passed away suddenly in 2015. Um, and that, you know, that was a big experience that kind of took me away from work, um, for a while. And as it happens right after that is when the Trump era began. So kind of trying to come back from the grief process into the Trump era beginning, it was like, it kind of became five years of just needing to step away and figure out how I want to come back into it. Um, so yeah, making videos, I really didn't do much of during the entire Trump era, still doing my radio show, uh, you know, still doing a lot of speaking engagements, but that doesn't, that's the type of work that there's no, there's not a record on the internet that I was doing that. Like that's work that you go and do in person and then to the internet, it looks like you're not active. Um, yeah, so that, it's that's like, the place we all want to be though. Like for real, that's the dream. Like the dream is when you get to a point where you have to, you don't have to be on the internet. It's better to not be online anymore. It's yeah. I would love to, I would love to really get to that for sure. Um, or at least like, like I said, like being in a position to not have to keep your brand hot in any form in social media would be an incredible blessing. Cause it, the more you could limit your time in these social media spaces, the better I think. But yeah, like it was, I think it's been a process over the last five years of kind of stepping away just to work through a grief process, um, take in all the trauma that just living in the Trump era has been at the same time and kind of working my way back to wanting to be on the mic, wanting to be on the camera. And also just as it happens, I had left WBAI because the radio, just the radio station was kind of fucking up and didn't represent what it used to. So I had to end the radio show during that same span of time. Um, and, and the last, the last like two or three years has kind of been a process of gradually coming back to it, starting up the radio show independently with the Bonfire Radio Network, um, doing which is like that's basically my main thing now. I had a couple of other projects there that kind of got derailed by the pandemic that hopefully I can start up again. And I've been doing the live streams that started off on Facebook and are now on Twitch. Oh, um, to check the streams a couple of times a week. I don't know why I didn't Let's even think it. to look at you on Twitch. I didn't even think to look it up one time. I'm going to go yeah, right you, What's your Twitch? Yeah, so that's been a super blessing. Um, and I started, like, right right when the pandemic hit. Like, I, I had some pretty big projects I was working on right when the pandemic hit, and it derailed them. And I, like, right at the point I was ready to for the project to go live and for me to start getting the checks, the pandemic hit. So I really had to, like, figure out something to be doing with myself. And I started doing the live streams just to have a place for us all to connect. And that like people, it became a really powerful thing. I think for all of us being able to connect and just like watch videos together, chop it up, like watch old hip hop clips and analyze them, watch old black movies and analyze. Um, yeah, and it quickly became, yeah, it became, just became this really dope community setting where, uh, like we could watch anything and it's going to be a great time just 
because of the comments right. that the community's bringing in the chat. What's about what's the? Can you can you give us the it's the J, um, J Smooth nine nine five? It's already linked. Yeah. Okay. I already linked yeah. it. Yes. Yo, I'm, I'm a guy okay. on Twitch. It's my. It's, I gotta be like J Smooth. You know, J Smooth. Yeah, well, that's, that's new. That's that's new. Yeah, the Twitch is still very new for me, and I'm like, it's fun to be doing something that I'm just doing it because I love it. Like, I'm not paying attention to the numbers when I'm on Twitch. Like. As I've got my like, it could be my like 30, 30 hardcore heads that come to everyone. Oh no, I'm already following. Ha! Damn, <laughs> we're so goddamn good sometimes. Hey, I that's myself. a good. That's a good Excuse moment me. when you're like, oh shit, I'm not following. Oh, I am. I did the good deed when the time came. Yes. <laughs> the other, the other end of that is when I'm on Twitter and somebody says something whack and then I go to their page to mute them and I already had them muted. <laughs> yeah, I'm already getting rid of the cornballs. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm, yeah, I've been doing the Twitch streams and I've been doing the radio show mainly for my Patreon supporters, which again is like, it's kind of liberating not to be calibrating everything for how do I get the biggest audience and just be doing something I love for a community of people that rock with it. And I've been blessed to have enough people that already connect with it that way to be sustaining. And, you know, and just, it's been, you know, the pandemic era, it kind of, I think for a lot of us, it probably feels like treading water, waiting for things to open up. Nah, I'm, I'm so in like the like opposite. Really hit the ground running. To be fair, a lot of people feel that way. I'm the opposite. I'm like, this shit made my life easier. I'm not going to lie. I've been like really vying for this. Like I was on the VR tip for the longest time, but the whole world is not ready to meet me there, so I went to Twitch. This was like more of a concession rather than like an elevation. Mm -hmm. It's like it's not where I want to be. This is just the closest thing to the skill set I need to deliver when VR hits that early critical mass that I can migrate into it seamlessly. Because you mm -hmm. need it's going to be live. Everything you do in VR is live. There's not going to be VOD. So right. whatever you do in radio, all of this is going to translate perfect to Avatar Land. And I feel like this is the move. This is the place to be. To, and, you know, like live MCing, all of these things are probably going to get real hot again because people aren't going to be fucked. You're going to have to have a good coder, though, that does some right. good graphic shit that's queued up perfectly to your world. But <clears throat> we're not there yet. So I jumped on Twitch, like, honestly, four months ago, five months ago. October? October is when we, like, really started on Twitch. So for me, this is a fucking new experience. I would not say this enough time has passed for me to not feel overwhelmed by the idea of being on Twitch still. But I feel everything you're saying about the community, it's it's actually really cool to, to have yeah. that. Like you said 10 beers. I'm like, yo, I have 10 people watching right now. It's fucking blessed. <laughs> like that's fucking yeah. cool. Right, 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 right. If you if you hit double digits, like to me, you're killing it for sure. Yo, it's but it's like And it's, it's like there's there's ways that you can make a shallow connection with large numbers of people with your art or your media or you can make deep connections with smaller numbers of people like like i've said for everything mm. there's pros and cons to each and i think live streaming especially it's a particular type of two-way interactive it's beautiful connection man. with the people who tune in that's different from anything else i've done before until your t pain and it's just to see your emotes yeah <laughs> i've been watching the youtube excerpts of his channel yeah I went on the other day and I was like, I don't know how you fucking could like really participate in this as a person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, just... that's, that's the benefit of not being one of the big, big, big Twitch streamers. You're right. There's no way. I mean, I guess you make a subscriber only chat and that slows it down some. <laughs> I was watching him gotta, literally. Yeah, you... He was trying to tell a story uh, and he couldn't go more than like 90 seconds without a sub coming in. Which is yeah. on the one hand, you're like, holy shit. But on the other hand, you're like, he sounded annoyed. Thank you for the sub. Like, it was so automatic. Like, right, because you got to say thank you. <laughs> but it's like he can't even get through a sentence or a story without, like, I'm like, I don't know if that's a good thing. or a, I mean, it's a, it's a weird thing. It's a weird I mean, thing to see. I think that we, we, we have yet to see, right? I think that we he might plateau, right? Mm -hmm. And, and... It becomes once every five minutes you hear the ding, yeah. and and then he has to hit Everyone the thank you, toes, and yeah. the thank you might be a little bit more pleasurable by then. Once he's right. on for a while, if he really genuinely enjoys the experience, you know, think then his it. then his thank yous might go back to being pleasant, you know. But right now, with the droves of them coming in, it's probably just like thank you, thank you, thank you, thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Like that ding, you know, the ding annoys me with text 
from my friends oh, that man. I love and that I want nothing but the best for. But as soon as like I get added to a group text amongst them, it's just like, oh my God, that that sound. And it's just for an LOL. It's just so annoying. It's like horrible, you know? So it's just like, I could understand where that, like that ding alone might be what's like killing them. No, the ding is wonderful sounds to me. I mean, I'm not at his level. Yeah. It's, every time you hear yeah, that. I, yeah, whenever I get the new follow, new subscribe, <laughs> oh. I set it up so I get my little graphic. <laughs> Let's go. I mean, it's just the most satisfying sound. Like Twitch put so much money yeah. into making <laughs> it hit my dopamine centers to hit my gambling addiction right. shits. Because, yo, I don't know if you've noticed the gamification and gambling centers that it taps into yeah, everywhere yeah. and it's monetization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fucking crazy. I love it, though. Don't get me wrong, because I'm having the best time. Since yeah, I've been on I Twitch, know. I'm trying to. Yeah, I know. It's so like when when it be setting off the hype train like it's because it's such a blatant gamification i feel weird about it. hey guys it's the hype train <laughs> but on the other hand but i don't but i don't want to act like i don't want people's support <laughs> but it's so like, I'm like yeah, about it it's not just like you as the creator i've watched creators be like guys okay stop the hype train and they won't they right. in the second a hype right. train if somebody rated me right now and a hype train started we're done for 15 minutes honestly i couldn't focus for the amount of dinglings that would be going off in my fucking ear and then we just have to wait for a fucking hype train to end and i'm like, not gonna, right i'm not really fiscally motivated to keep the interview going proper in that moment <laughs> It hasn't happened to me yet, though. But I've had, I was I was actually a guest on somebody else's show, and he got a hype train. So that's how I know this 15-minute number is not, like, fucking fake. Cause yeah, I don't think mine have gone that long, but yeah. He broke level five. He got rated by somebody with, like, 100, and they all started I, gifting. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm so happy for you. Like, <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. <laughs> you know, like, it's not like you're jealous, but you're like, man, why does yeah, it have to be you, on my seen it with You saw it with your own two eyes. You saw it happen, so you're like, yo, it could happen to me one day. And now it's over. Now I'm just like, maybe one day Mr. Beast will find me, which is the most impractical <laughs> thought to have. Like, right? why would you? Yeah. That's like yeah, playing. It's not worth, yeah, it's not worth worrying about. You got to make it. dope shit. Nah, that's why I talk to guys like you now. Well, I mean, that's always <laughs> been what it is, but it's just like that happened like last week. I think it was last week I watched that hype train happen, so it was like fresh on my mind when he said that. But uh, the DJs are milking the shit out of hype trains. You know, it's fucked because, you know, they don't have to stop their content. They just go, hype train, boop, 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 boop. And then right. people go, like, double down on that shit. I've watched people break level five hype trains, and then you throw in. You're like, I want the emote. So you <laughs> fucking throw in on the hype train. You can't help it. <laughs> throw in 100 bits. What's 100 bits? <laughs> anyway. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's, I'm torn because... You know, working for WBAI, it's a nonprofit station where we got to fundraise. So I spend years and years going super hard, like, okay, you got to call, call the phone, make one more pledge, come on. But it, when it's time to do that for myself, I feel super weird about it. <laughs> but I think I think it's healthy to be comfortable with asking for it for yourself. But I think partly because I know it's Amazon who's kind of an evil corporation and it's so clearly <laughs> like gamified to kind of manipulate people. Yeah. Um, apologies to the overlords running the stream. Yeah. Y'all know, know what time it is. I mean, come on. It is what it is. Uh, I'm happy. Yeah, to it's hard, like that. It's hard to get used to, but that's, I'm sure that's that always I'm... the compromise. Like, no, none of us are going to be completely pure. Right? Well, I mean, I don't even think it's a matter of like purity. I mean, it's like this. If you get the funding to produce the art that is blessed because you don't have to stress about finances, the contribution that you can give to the world is pretty powerful. Like, I think right. people in society value, like, yo, this whole, like, crypto thing is baffling to me. It's like y'all are, like, more concerned with, like, gambling into success. That's how I look at it. Like, even if you look at investing, it's just long-term gambling in a lot of ways. Like, so it's like you'd rather, like, hedge bets and, like, wait then like actually do like do something with it you know like just try to build in your life or something so like i i hear what you're saying i mean this i've been i've been trying on the internet for a long time and failing upwards for a very very long time that's how i like see my life is a lot of failing upwards um and it's not quick to me i tell everyone seven to ten years or don't start like be willing i think to that that's a fair assessment for life period though you know like if we all are failing upwards like yeah. nobody had a Nobody was born out here with the like handbook. The only people that were born with handbooks were like 
the super, super rich, right? Mm. Because it's just like, all right, we're going to run the same play we've ran for centuries. We're just going to depend on all these companies that we've set up to keep on running exactly how they've been running. Mm -hmm. We're just going to keep on being rich. We're just going to keep on raising kids to the rich Mm -hmm. that are just going to keep on walking into this richness. So that's like a general handbook that they have that's kind of like fine that works and does, like the play yeah. doesn't have to change. But like nobody else is born with a handbook that it's like that it's like that, you know. So we're all just kind of failing upward. We're all just failing our way to success. Mm-hmm. And you got to have a firm grip. I've really had to learn this over the whole arc of working online, and especially nowadays as algorithms become more and more dominant in determining your success. Like no knowing that the quality and the value of your work is not accurately reflected by the metrics. Like, cause right. you get lucky, the algorithms will bless you. Some high profile person will link to the latest thing you did. You'll get 50,000 views. Then the next thing is 2000 views is very hard to remain confident that the 2000 view thing was as good as the 50,000 view thing, but it's completely just the slot machine hit you up on the 50,000 view one. I'm just sitting here. Your work is consistent. You have to really believe that and hold on to it so you can keep at it. I've never tasted 50,000 views. I'm where I thought 2,000 views is sexy and 200 views. (laughs) So I'm like, yeah, I understand that. But I think it's just important because I think, uh, I mean, I'm at the point where I've seen people come and go because they didn't understand what they were signing up for. That's why I think it's interesting that you like bring it like that because you're like, nah, there's no shortcuts. Nah, there's no way around yeah. it. Nah, no, you, you have just got to be you good. Have to that it's a journey, man. I had interns at the radio show, like young dudes that wanted to rap, and they would always ask me, like, so what's the thing I got to do? They would speak about success as if there's a single step that they have to figure out. Like, there's a button you're going to press. And I, it would be so hard to get them to understand, like, no, you take a step, then another step on a journey i can't tell you the step like yeah, you, no. you have to be bad at rapping for another three years and, <laughs> yeah. doing it. and then <laughs> af- after those three years you got to get other people to listen to your shit that's not whack anymore uh, you you got to think about being on a journey and figuring out what the next steps are there's no button you're going to press that teleports you from here to there yeah, yeah these are there's no things. there's no magic trick no, that's amazing. I mean, I appreciate and you got to and you got to love. I mean, this is talking about journeys is super corny and cliche, no, but you got to love cool. being on that journey. Like is yeah. what you care about is being able to do that teleportation. You, you're never going to get where you want to be. You got to love being able to take each step. I prefer the word quest, but I feel like the concept's the same. That's, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is. But uh, the no, it's journey about pretty that. much the same. But... but it's not corny to me. It's like that's that's what it is that's how you do these things in my opinion and like and it's the same thing not to cut you off it's the same thing with political work and activism like there's never going to be a day where we got rid of racism or we ended white supremacy Mm. so you have to your sense of meaning and fulfillment has to be from being in community doing that work it can't be from thinking there's a finish line you're going to get to or else you're not going to be able to stay in it yeah that's big too I like I like everything you're saying. You should definitely write a book. You should write a lot of. Books. Should definitely write a book. Should definitely definitely write a book. No, I read That's, a lot of that like. Just makes sense, like, and I think that your audience is there for it. You just don't even realize it. Like, I think that might be one of those things where, like, that's when you might see more of a, a even more people standing up to be like, "Oh, I'll support this. I'll buy your book." But they can, you on know, a real like, real, you could pull off the next subtle art of not giving a fuck if you wanted to. You're in like that tier, of, I, in my opinion. And I mean, stylistically, like you could approach the topic because that's all it ever is, right? I think that's why a lot of us stop ourselves is because literally all these books are the fucking same book over and over and over and over and over and over. That's and over what I was again. about to say. Like, I'm not actually saying anything new. And that's something else to bring in to whatever work you do, right? Like, none of us are ever saying anything new, but. But your you style, my a, guy. Right. Yo. You can find a fresh way. Like, that's that's what every political discussion is. Like, we're always hitting the same roadblocks on these same fundamental issues. And you got to find fresh ways to talk about it and get people to think about it. 
And I think that's where your charm comes in because while you may say it's the same topics, I don't think I've heard many people use your takes and your deliveries, but it feels like you're very ahead of your time. I'll use the the term Flacco used. Jay Smooth is going to be on the right side of history on most issues. <laughs> and I happen to agree with him. <clears throat> Facts. That's an absolute fact. Oh, that which, by the way, segues into why uh, you said that I brought it up to you, mm. Holden, and I said, when Jay Smooth comes on the show, I'm going to be like, yo, you were totally on the right side of history with Dave Chappelle. <laughs> we're like, I fought you people, on that. Most like, people I, are still not with I me. I fought on you that. on that. Like, I hardly ever disagree with you. And like, because I always know, like, it's like, mostly like, yo, I know that Jay's perspective is coming from like, a, he sat there and thought this through more so than anybody else. So more than likely, I find myself agreeing with you more so than any of my other friends. Blindly, sometimes you could even say, just because I have the confidence in what you're, the way that you go about thinking things through. So I'll, I would like blindly like agree with you most times, right? And that time, like I super like, was like, nah, nah, Jay, you're bugging. Like Dave's, Dave's out here, you know, He's like doing it. He's back. He's back. And then like I sat back and like watched the whole thing un unfold across the last few years. And it's just been like, oh my God, this is this is just not I don't I don't I don't feel good watching this. Like it doesn't feel it doesn't what? feel right. Like I expect I like, yeah, I do expect more from Dave, you know? Like Yeah, and I'll always have tremendous respect for Dave. Yeah, you tremendous know, I, respect. I don't even want to litigate all the reasons yeah. I'm frustrated with him now. But yeah, I do. Yeah, I think uh, it's hard, you know, when someone is of such a good, such an incredible, incredible writer, talent, such an incredible writer, performer, storyteller. They can weave a whole narrative that makes you ignore how they're not actually making sense. Mm. Like it'll mm -hmm. sound like they're making a good ass point, and you'll get so wrapped up in it that you don't step back and actually analyze the logic and say, "Well, wait." No, that actually doesn't make sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> He's just such a masterful performer and just understands the mechanics of comedy and storytelling so well that it sounds like he's dropping fucking bombs right now. And I think it's, I hope, yeah, I mean, I think over time more people are going to catch on. To Honestly, shit not being quite I, think, a, um, <clears throat> I think the whole comedy field is going to take a lot of hits right now as they um, mix the idea of criticism and free speech up. Um, yeah, I mean, this and this, I had a real dope conversation with another uh, comic. I could tell you off mic who it is. We were talking about Dave and his last few specials, and he broke down for me how when you're a comedian, you master what he called comedy logic. Like, you need to make a certain amount of sense in order to make a joke land, but the logic that gets you to the joke landing isn't necessarily an actual logical representation of how this shit works in real life. And when you spend your whole life figuring out comedy logic, like how to surprise people with a punchline that's a left turn from the premise and make that work, you start to lose track of what's comedy logic and what's actual mm -hmm. logic in the world. And I think Dave, he's mixing up comedy logic and actual logic in some of his discussion of issues <laughs> nowadays. And he's yeah. so good at the comedy logic that I think a lot of people aren't catching on. I just, yeah. I've and noticed the sentiment that he has shared by a lot of people on youtube and i spent the last three or four the last two years really thinking about offensive and obvious and i think that a lot of people stop learning how to read the room of eight billion people and right. that's the thing that they don't realize is like yo you went online you chose you chose to stay in the game online like i mean you look at it like like whatever whatever and maybe there is context points and whatnot but not a netflix special that is the most deliberate shit you could ever do in your life <clears throat> that thing is going to be vetted in shit, I'm sure. Or right. Maybe not. And that's, I guess, so, like, th this week there were a lot of tweets, maybe because, I don't know. I don't know anything how, about how the off, But there were a bunch of tweets about, like, if George Carlin was around today, his Twitter would get banned. If Richard Pryor was around today, he would have got banned on Twitter. And I don't think y'all appreciate no, that. I don't think so. Someone like Richard Pryor was great because... <laughs> he was reflective and he adapted and evolved. Richard Pryor is the comic who used the N-word incredibly brilliantly his whole career and then said, you know what? 
I don't ever want to use that word again. He reflected and evolved with the times and kept up. So what people aren't realizing is if Richard Pryor was alive today, he would have been paying attention and evolving and he would have fit in on Twitter. Yeah, like, people, people, think they're giving, people think they're giving somebody props by saying if he was around today, he would get banned. But no, you're insulting them. You don't realize I, I they know how to evolve think more than you do. You can just, I once went through George Carlin's, I, I don't know how to, filmography, whatever. I, I torrented all 18 specials and I watched them in a row. Nah, George Carlin evolved like a motherfucker. And yeah. George Carlin was super aware of who he was in the world. Like he was mm -hmm. super aware he's a white dude. Like he, mm -hmm. ne he never forgot that when he talked about anybody. Like he never let that slip his mind. He was hyper right. aware of it. Maybe like the 70s is different than the 90s. I can't like whatever, you know, like shit evolves. But like <clears throat> I don't look at like, yo, because one of the people in the comments just said uh, what Dave Chappelle's doing is more social satire. And maybe that's true. But the one thing I find these satire know. things. I don't want to start up there. Come come see me on Facebook. We could have this debate. <laughs> but yeah, uh, no, I... the one thing I want to say about satire is it requires like a knowledge set of like what makes it satire that nobody makes obvious and they leave it to a lot of people who don't have the social cues to understand what could be satire about it to interpret it without explaining it in any kind of clarity is my experience with a lot of modern satire and i use those quotations and i just want to say if that's the game and the angle put a fucking disclaimer that th right and is the thing with me at the end of the day is don't make bullshit arguments and just as an example when Dave Chappelle's talking about the Me Too movement and he says, uh, I agree with you, but you can't go so hard because men need to be comfortable or else you're never going to win. First of all, that's the exact opposite of how he talks about his own issues. When he wanted to renegotiate his contract with Netflix, he wasn't saying, let's not uh -huh. go too hard because we got to make sure they're comfortable or they'll never give us what we need. He was like, uh -huh. they're going to give me what I need or else I'm going to take it. And we all cheered for that shit. Mm -hmm. but it's about women he doesn't think women are supposed to do that and then in the next special after he said that he said that abortion rights are being taken away because women didn't listen to dave Chappelle when he told them not to go so hard on me too and i'm sorry but that's a bullshit argument there's been a mission to take away abortion rights since before dave Chappelle started doing con a highly organized highly funded campaign to systematically take away abortion rights has nothing to do about how anyone's reacting to the Me Too movement. So that's a bullshit argument. Don't make bullshit arguments. Yeah, I'm with you with that. Yeah. And that's where, like, the, I don't know. I, I, like, I hear you, but I, also, I can tell like, you, there's a lot of historical tell... shit that you really have to Google to understand. The, like, Because I hear where you're coming from with that. And, like, it'd probably take an Listen, hour to, like, break it down properly, you know? That's why, no, that's why, I, yeah, I didn't actually want to get into that. Cause it's, and, like, then, just, and then, uh, like, look. As a fan, right, like somebody who's not even smart enough to have that, like, opinion, right? Like, just as a general Dave Chappelle fan, huge fan, right? Before all the hype, like, before everybody jumped in, like, big Dave Chappelle fan, always been. But it's just, like, after a while, it gets tiring listening to him, Kevin Hart, and everybody whine about, like, oh, man, I'm going to get banned for saying this. I, I can't say that. I can't say this. I can't say that. How about you just talk about what you can say? Like, there's so much more that you can right. say if you really were still being as creative as you you're once right. were. You but don't, now you're, you're just, yeah. it seems like you're really comfortable with, like, making as much money. as You're you're complaining about how you're not allowed to say what you want to say while being on the biggest platforms online saying what you want to say and being applauded for it. So, like, it doesn't make any sense to, like, continuously over and over complain about what you can't say in every special while simultaneously saying those same exact things. It's just, it's pretty tiring. And like, as a fan of real comedy, like it's just, it, it shows me they're not putting in a really great effort. Right. Like they like, used to be. I listened to Chris Jericho's podcast one time to take it back to wrestling. He was talking about how when the Attitude Era ended, a lot of his peers were like, damn, well, how, how are we supposed to get our shit off now that we have to be PG? And he said his attitude was like, no, if. If you're as good as you say you are, you shouldn't have to rely on that to get over. And you mm -hmm. see this and Chris Jericho has stayed on top all throughout what they call That's the true. PG era, while a lot of other people. So if you if you really believe in yourself like cut that. His hair. <laughs> I mean, he's kind of a weird, he's like some kind of Trump supporting weirdo off <laughs> away from the scene, but he's still a great wrestler. Um 
But yeah, but, I'm, look, I'll always love Dave, but yeah, I always love. Dave, I think but, he gets he gets he's so good at running his rap that we don't always be really thinking. Like his last special, he got me into it. I was like, yeah, you're right. We're gonna stop watching the special. We're gonna. I felt like we were starting the revolution. Then they they changed his contract, and he was like, we won. And I said, yeah, we won. Wait, what did we win? He renegotiated <laughs> his contract. I didn't win it. <laughs> that wasn't the revolution. He was just getting a better contract. <laughs> but that's how good that's how good he is at running his rap on us. Yeah, no, nah, he's great at it. He's great at it. He's absolutely great at it. And it's just, for me, like, I'm generally getting tired of listening to comedians. Like, it's literally like the same way walking into the Trump era. They were, I watched all the comedians walking into the Trump era looking at it like, yeah, we're better than that. We don't got to go for the low-hanging fruit. I don't got to talk about Trump all special long because I'm better comedian than that. And it's like, I, I can't stand the fact that they could walk into that doing that, but, like, you can't just shift and just stop, like, stop trying to, like, make a joke out of how people want to live their lives. Stop trying to make a joke out of, like, out of, like, like, don't, uh, uh, don't make it life choices for not having to hear what other people are saying yeah you know like it's just it's, it's silly. almost like that's it's, become his brand yeah and while and, still and, doing dope like there's always brilliant shit in each of his specials still i'm not saying he's trash. Yeah, absolutely now. he's a great writer just, right? like he's being stubborn and petulant about yes. some of the ways he still needs to evolve and sometimes that leads him into making bullshit arguments yeah Oof. But that's we we off way off on a tangent now. Apologies. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Oh, man, <laughs> but yeah, I wanted to apologize because I was on <laughs> I was on the oh, wrong side good. of history. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. I'm glad to have you on board because that's out of everything I post on Facebook, that's the shit where nobody's trying to hear me <laughs> when I criticize Dave. <laughs> and now, I, I already and know. I was, Dave, I, I'm a I was a Dave super fan. I was in the studio audience for his show twice. Word. Like I'm a hardcore Word. Dave. It's not like I'm a Dave hater. No, that's why it's, not. that's why it's frustrating to me that I feel like, like he's I feel like away a little. somewhere along the way, society stopped being okay with like you not liking things for reasons. <laughs> right. And like, like I don't think anybody has said Dave is not exceptionally talented, entertaining, etc., etc., etc. It's really just like maybe a couple of your jokes you should reconsider them and not double down right. in the other direction like right. and it sometimes yeah. feels like when you say that in the world of comedy and one of the people in the audience brought up mike ward now i live in quebec i don't know if you know about mike ward's situation i don't know mike ward he made a joke about a, a kid who whatever was had like metal things because of a disease i don't remember i'm trying to know how to fucking say it right but like the guy was like let's say handicapped in some way and Mike Ward made a joke about that, and then the kid sued him through the Quebec Human Rights Tribunal, and it has been effectively a hot topic in comedy in my city for like a decade because it's still an ongoing case, and it went to like the Human Rights Tribunal over a joke with like $50,000 fines and stuff, and wow. is this right, is this wrong? And I noticed a lot of the comics I know personally, who shall go unnamed, really took it personal as like a collective assault and then brought that attitude almost towards people like if i disagree with the ethical premise of your joke i should be allowed to interact with you on a personal level on facebook and not be grouped into counterculture or censorship now nah, i'm just allowed i should be allowed to discourse with you like that's what it should be like but now nah, i watched them flip their script now nah, why are you all hating on me i mean they don't use that language but that's what they're saying and it's like then it seems like they double down into a cycle of trying to go harder and harder to piss off more and more people, probably because their numbers are going up at that point, and it's the first time they're getting buzz. And like, I just see this cycle play out, and it's like I, I forgot about that. But like, this guy is in Quebec, and it's like a huge part of like at least my city's like attitude that shifted. But it like, it makes them almost double down to defend a Dave Chappelle type because he's one of theirs, and now they've also affiliated with these other ideas and this. This conspiracy, I call it a conspiracy that the whole world is trying to silence comics because, like, I've never seen that happen in my life, really. But apparently, that's a real thing. And I don't know. It's just this weird world in comedy. I don't know what's happening, but it seems all sorts of weird. I don't, I don't think they're ever going to be silenced. Like, it's like comedians are like, same thing as like rappers, you know? Like, you literally find a comedian in every one of our neighborhoods and every one of our families. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, 
yeah, as Mike as Epps as, yeah. came from us. Like all of the comedians from us come from us. That's how you get. You know, like comedy can't ever go anywhere. Like nobody's after mm-hmm. them. You brought like, a good point. I, there's so I do many think of there's them. something. Yeah, I do think there's something to be said for as you're mastering your craft as a stand-up comic, it used to be a lot easier to have a space where you're working and fine-tuning and learning and yeah. it's limited within that room. Now, you can't, like you gotta be ready for something to go online and go viral, so there's not, I, I can understand having a concern that you don't have a space to incubate and learn and figure things out because shit's gonna get the scrutiny of the entire world online. Like I, I understand that being a real concern, but I think, there's like there's an overcorrection from the stand-up comic world where like fuck any criticism we don't want anyone to ever criticize any of us um one of my friends from the comedy world called it uh you know how comics have the you know how police have the blue wall of silence comics have the red brick wall of silence (laughs) like we don't we don't ever want to hear anyone get criticized so there's there's got to be a middle ground where we understand it could be harder in some ways to evolve as a comic but but you want it to be one way, but it's the other way. We all got to be able to evolve. Mm. Mm-hmm. And there's also- never an excuse. And there's never an excuse to not care how your work is impacting people. But you can also- choose to do that and still be successful, but it's, it's whack. I don't know. I just, break, I like to break jokes down and think about what the actual point of the joke is when I hear a joke. And um, I don't know. I don't like the angle that a lot of comics I hear take. So I don't really go that deep into the world of stand-up comedy anymore. Cause I don't understand why I like it. Like George Carlin made me feel like I want to be a political activist when I'm done one of his shits. Okay. And I laughed the whole time. He taught me about language, taught me about the things in humanity that brought, like, you know, that walking up the stairs bit, it's like the most fucking basic human joke. And I realized it's about bringing people together through the humor and the things that are like aligned with us. When you complain about censorship norms, I mean like, listen, you're punching up, you're hitting the government. Like there's all these little things I saw that he does that I don't see the people, other people necessarily doing to the same extent as him. I don't know enough about Richard Pryor, to be honest. But I do know a lot about Carlin and what made what attracted me to Carlin's humor that is not present in a lot of people's humor that I find hard to get into. And a lot of times it's this, like, a lot of times, like, I stopped watching Joe Rogan's podcast. Like, I watched it and then I had to stop. And I start watching people and then I have to stop because like, there's just something like, nah, these people, like, aren't about people. You know, like it's it's about yeah. whatever is going to get the numbers or the views or the rush or the this. And it creates this like cult like attitude around them, which then makes their content kind of inherently worse over time because yes, man, and this is and that. It's like that's how you end up with a pink round room. Right. Yeah. I, I used to watch because I watch MMA. So I used to watch when they were discussing MMA, but it gets it gets a little too weird when they're not doing that. I back like when, back when like Immortal Joe. Technique was like his like star, guest star. Yeah, yeah. I know? feel like if we could just lock Joe Rogan in a room and make him only talk to like Cornell West and Immortal Technique and a few other people like that for six months, he could be doing a whole different show. I feel like he's real malleable. Whole different show. Yes, he is. Like he, he kind of nods and agrees with who's ever in front of him. But up, let's be real. A certain point. That Alex and he's Trump. been in a feedback loop of Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson ass people. But it's also like, that's what gets in the views. That's who his audience is. I mean, like, exactly. yo, I'm not going to lie. I don't want to watch Joe Rogan unless uh, the only guest I think I'm going to go back for is what's his name? Uh, fucking Alex Jones. I'll watch an Alex Jones episode any day of the week. <laughs> I will sh- not. But he is entertaining. I can understand that. Alex Jones taught me a lot about history things that led me to Googling a lot of black history things that I, you would be surprised at how much history i learned because i listened to alex jones and then i'm able to filter when he loses it like if you can filter as long as you recognize when you need to find the off ramp no but that's when it turns into fun you know a little bit but i understand the danger look i'm saying it with the full implications of i understand the danger of it but damn does alex jones teach you a lot of things to google and it makes it kind of a valuable experience if you don't know as much about the world of conspiracy theories However, I'm saying that with like a whole bunch of context. That's probably not why most people watch it. It's not why most people watch it. They believe. <laughs> yeah, they that's, believe. That's volatile. They fully believe that, like, uh, the, everything that he puts on video. Yeah, just just, just, like, just make make sure you think critically about whatever Google path he sends you on. Nah, man, you, 
trust. I'm I'm okay with that. I read a lot of books and stuff. I just he's good to start the journey. You just don't trust his logic. It's just that you can often find his sources and then discern your own truth from it. Is what I like to do with a lot of these people because I'm curious about that world. Like I'm super curious about it. Anyway, I, I I agree with you though. It's it's a lot of preposterous stuff, but I don't know. At least those episodes weren't terrible to me. But in general, I was just trying to say like I can't really get into what they do philosophically for the most part because it's it's weird to watch it like i don't learn anything i don't get anything about it like i don't feel good after it's like eating bad food <laughs> yeah. yeah facts that's why i'm glad to have people that i know like jay smooth you know mm. that like provide me like uh, uh content in my feed and on radio that's just different than the same uh, just non-critical thinking um, people out there just kind of parroting each other. Mm. Now you have a you have a great sense of, kind of spirit. Honestly, it's 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 been really great talking to you. Like you're like chicken soup. I don't know. I guess I'm hungry. <laughs> Definitely hit the part where my stomach's like influencing me. <laughs> Uh, but no, like I, I realize sometimes when I eat a thing of chicken soup, you really do have that weird like soul feeling where it's like nice. And I, I don't know that I guess that's how that book series started. But I feel like talking to you is like, like we don't find people like you a lot in our lives, in, in regular people lives that are just so like selflessly for the cause about it. That's some big respect. I mean, if you say so, you know, I'm trying to. You know, nah, that's I'm that's definitely that's definitely. I'll echo that right now. Like, like, just know that you know, like, you're you are appreciated. You know, like, mm -hmm. I know in in our circle, you know, like, there's a uh, an immense uh, like esteem. Like, I even look at like something like CF being so wild. Like, he was not being disingenuous. I know CF. Like, I know how he is. Like, he's just like dead. Like. Holy shit, like you know Jay Smooth, bro. He like be stopping by your posts, like to talk. Like what? Like that makes that's like another, you know, but that's just that goes to show that exactly. Like the esteem that we hold for you, you know? Like the um the appreciation that we have for you and your presence and uh and like how critically you think and care about this culture and your your people, you know? So yeah. I thank you. I mean, those are the two things I always want to do is I want to be a good representative of the culture when I'm out in the world and I want to show up and represent my principles in the culture. But, uh, you know, those are the two things I always want to try and uh, balance out, you know, and always, you know, that's why I like, I've kept the name Jay Smooth and brought it into venues where people don't be having names like that. And it would have been real easy for me to, get rid of that because you, you go on like msnbc and you're jay smooth <laughs> people react a certain way like it doesn't help people take you seriously but i've always wanted to hold on to that because i want to stay connected to having this voice because it's the voice that hip-hop gave me and remember that i'm here to represent that wherever else i go and that's the kind of thing that makes you kind of legendary in my eyes legend. yeah, big legend I just want to thank you for coming through. I feel like we're at that point where like it's it's like running out of the natural steam of things a little bit. It's been you you passed that three hour threshold, and in my like rule of life, only the most brilliant people of the interesting break three hours easy like that. And I, that, that's just what well, it I've, is. I've had a great. I've had a great. It's been really great talking with y'all for sure. I've had a great time. Which Yo, it's a blessing. No, right? thank honestly. you for blessing us with your presence, like, for bro. Real, for real, bro. like this is a gift. Like I look Watch at these like. Here. I, and I say it a lot because I feel like almost every conversation I have on this channel turns into like a big gift and we all learn and we all gain stuff. Like you taught us context, yeah. business advice, how to value ourselves. Every entrepreneur listening now knows to up their price a little bit, find an agent if you can't do it yourself. All sorts of crazy, interesting tips that you just link through. The whole way through, um, you kind of like end up in this situation where you stay pure to your principles and beliefs this is the way you finesse some of the complicated answers and then you knew when to give it like you're you're definitely a professional i get a little more nervous talking to the oh. interviewers because you I know even gave you even you even gave people a cheat code to to ted talks big facts. like you know like you do you you know that's that was a nice one that was like 
look, just get involved locally. Yeah, and just, you, you find your way to TEDx. It's not going to get any views unless you promote it. But if you you can yeah. get it done. But like the bigger thing the is. I know for a fact when I talk to the interview people, y'all know exactly what I'm doing the entire way through. So you just hand it to me. <laughs> like it's like you're giving me the gift, especially. Yeah. And so just thank you for that because I know that you could have chose to not play along slash do it well or stick around as long. And so that's like personally I take that like a gift. And so I just want to thank you for that as well. And just for your contributions in life. Like you're going to end up with all the YouTube documentaries and shits in the future too. It's coming. I mean, hopefully better production. Maybe you get HBO. Who knows? But like something's <laughs> coming your way, man. Because your whole Yo, put it in the air, put it in the world. Yes, like, Jay Smooth. But like, Stop. I swear I've watched enough of these to know that I just talked to somebody whose life is the plot to one of these. <laughs> yes, no facts. Absolutely, absolutely. That's good. That's good. To hear. Now let's now let's find the agent who agrees with that. <laughs> Word. And I'm gonna be in business. Let's that into a clip. Let's get that going. But um, on that note, though, I do appreciate you again for that. I feel like I say it a lot, but you should say it a lot when you mean it. Um, and uh, I thank you for that. I mean, if you ever want to come back in the future, it'd be mad blessed. We're gonna link yeah, all your stuff. Yeah. You know, I've I've done a lot of I've done many, many, many interviews on both sides of it. So I definitely appreciate how you facilitated the conversation. Thank you for that. I appreciate that compliment for real. Um, but like. Uh, at the end of the day, though, as much as it's fun to thank you and Flacco for holding it down as also, but thanks for the people watching, cause yo, it yeah. stayed, it basically stayed above ten the whole time, which to me is Dope. the biggest compliment. It dipped a couple, but whatever's, uh, definitely didn't go below eight. So that's a big fucking win for the length of this stream and the fact that it's just a conversation, yeah. which means unless you know they're not. It's you that's interesting. They all hear my shit all the time, so it's really you that's interesting that makes it happen uh, when it goes this long, at least. And then, um, yeah, so thank you for that. Thank you, people watching in the future, too, because I know this is going to be on the futures, and this is not just a moment in time, and you're all appreciated, too. Make sure to subscribe and you know, hit up the EOWTV to follow End of the Week on all of their stuff because without End of the Week, Shout this conversation week. would never fucking have happened. So we got to be a big love to them as well. And Big that's low, super important. Um, do you have any like last uh, things you would like to say to the world before we start a raid in part ways? Yeah, I mean, come check me out at the Patreon. You can catch the radio show there, patreon.com slash illdoctrine. Um, it's real cheap for you to keep in touch with the show. We got a big archive. And yeah, keep, you know, keep in touch. I'm on, I'm jsmooth995 on Facebook, Twitter, and so on. And uh, as we come out of the pandemic, I'm gonna be uh, brewing up some new projects as well. So you know, I look, I hope, I hope we can stay disciplined for the next few months hmm. and come out of the other side and then keep on pushing because we can't, we can't go back to the world we had before this. We got to learn like hmm. we did with the WRCs. Let's learn from how this went wrong and build something better. <laughs> Big facts. Yo, thank you all for coming though again one more time and live long and prosper, everyone. And now I'm gonna start. The